Good morning, good morning. It is Tuesday, February 27th. We are starting the morning of day four of the state versus Hannah Gutierrez or Hannah Gutierrez Reed, depending on which document you look at. She is the armorer from the set of rust. Yesterday morning started with the FBI and uh, forensics, ballistics, the guy who broke the gun doing the destructive testing because he literally put the gun in a whole bunch of different positions at rest, full cock, half cock, quarter cock, all of the different uh, positions of the weapon and then struck it with a mallet to see if it would accidentally discharge and it didn't, it broke instead. So that was the morning we learned that the uh, powder in the bullets came, the powder in the bullets from Seth Kinney, PDQ Arm and Props was uh, chemically different than the powder at the, uh, the movie set. We haven't seen how those got there or what but then the afternoon we got to the first percipient witness or the first eyewitness. That is the person that was in the scene. Ross was the camera grip. He was standing shoulder to shoulder with director Joel Souza when the shot went off. They were like a foot or two away from Baldwin when that 45 revolver went off in the church. Well, when he shot it in the church. And so he was actually tending to the wounds of Joel Souza in the church when this happened. Um, things I didn't like about the prosecutor's direct, she never asked him about the lawsuit. She should have, amongst other things, I think she kind of set him up on cross-examination for the defense to get into it with him. And maybe that was strategy that um, she wanted the defense to look like a jerk digging into this witness, but I think it might have changed some people's minds about the witness. He's clearly been through a very traumatic event, seeing his friend killed in front of him. Then the cross-examination got spicy, and at one point, the prosecution was objection, objecting properly, and the defense was like, am I even going to get to do my cross? And then the prosecution was like, I mean, if you do it properly. And the court, I'm summarizing, was basically like, children, just can we, it's late in the day, can you not do all of this? So I think today's going to get a little spicy, but it looks like the prosecution might stick with putting up their scientific witnesses in the morning and their percipient witnesses in the afternoon. We'll see. I always like doing it the other way around. I liked having my percipient witnesses in the morning, put the scientific witnesses on after lunch, because at the end of the day, they go through a lot of talking to get to two points. Like the, the weapons guy, a lot of talking to understand that that revolver had to fire with the hammer back and the trigger pulled. And the prosecution hasn't done a fantastic job of tying those things in. I think she's waiting to just argue it later. Um, I think tying it in for the jury as you go so they know why it's important is helpful. I do that here for y'all, but she hasn't been doing it. So um, for all of you that have reached out, I got to go through some of my DMs yesterday. For all of you that are in the movie industry that reached out, um, who are watching this trial, thank you. Thank you for being in the chat, sharing your expertise. Thank you for reaching out in DMs, sharing your expertise, sharing your experience on movie sets. And what I've seen from everyone who's reached out to me is when a set is unsafe, it is on the person whose job it is to either rectify the situation or to walk and it's not an easy choice and seeing so many of you in in the industry and um ian runkle who is also a weapons expert saying the same thing while i'm empathetic to hannah gutierrez's um struggle with walking away from this job if she had would this have gone differently or would it at least not be on her hands? We'll continue to see today. Court is back in session. I'm hoping that we get a little time at 1.25 speed so we can zoom through the sidebars that we can't hear anyway and through some of the other things. They're starting with the medical examiner, so here is my warning. There will probably be some photos of clothes that were cut off the victim. Things are gonna be bloody. You're not going to see and if you do, somebody has absolutely fucked up, but you're not going to see autopsy photos and things like that. We are going to hear about the bullet wound that killed Helena Hutchins. This is an involuntary manslaughter case. The prosecution does have to prove that somebody died. That's why the ME is here. Look, if the ME didn't say that they determined time of death by putting their arms in or putting their hands in the armpits of the decedent, I think we're going to be doing better than in South Carolina during the Murdoch trial when I was never more flabbergasted than when the Emmy's like, no, I just put my hands in the victim's armpits. N no, no. So we're hoping for a little more professionalism today. And with all of that, we're going to roll it. You guys, let me know where you're coming in from, what you're drinking. I've got a, I got a little bit of a cup of cappuccino this morning. 
And we're going to go to live court right after this. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not Let's get into it. Robin Elmwood in the chat said that corner was the pits. Absolutely. Oversee the yeah. operations of the OLI. This is the corner. Let me make sure the, the I'm going to boost this out a little. Who are there. In addition, I also perform autopsies to determine the cause and the manner of death. She's done okay. over 3,000 autopsies. A brief explanation about your educational background. Sure. She's done over 3,000 autopsies. I have a bachelor's autopsies. degree um, from Valdosta State so. University in Valdosta, Georgia. Then no I went disrespect to, to zoom zoom through her University qualifications. School of Medicine in Macon, Georgia. Ma'am, you're immensely qualified. I graduated with a medical degree. Then I completed a residency in I anatomic pathology. I don't know why the screen is frozen. At the Hold University on. of Virginia. Uh, technology is delightful, and right now the I don't know why the video screen is frozen. Hold on. Um, you know, every day is a new day. <laughs> every day is a new day when we're in trial, particularly. So let's try this one more time and see if the video will actually sync with the audio and i'm board certified oh, look at that. in anatomic pathology then i completed a fellowship good to see you honors in neuropathology at the same institution and i'm board certified in neuropathology and then lastly i completed a forensic pathology fellowship at the uh, New Virginia hairstyle Public today university and i'm board certified in forensic pathology i definitely wore my hair like that to prom forensic in pathology. the 90s a forensic pathologist i don't know if it's my court hairstyle but determine the cause and the manner of death and what about anatomical pathology? A person who is an anatomic pathologist uh, can perform autopsies, usually in a hospital setting, to determine um, what caused death. Um, but they also can uh, determine, like, for example, if you have surgery and have something removed, let's say a, a, a cancerous lesion, the pathologist is the one who. I appreciate being able to zoom zoom through all the um, all the and background training and experience. You in your career? I so. have I've performed and supervised over 3,500 or 3,500 examinations, plus about, about 500 autopsies. neuropathology consultations. That's and a lot of autopsies. any training uh, specific to injury analysis? Can you be more specific? Um, I mean, that's part of our standard training. Just training in terms training. of determining how, uh, how an injury may have affected uh, an individual's Sir, body that's and how that may have literally the, the person's death. That's literally that would the be job. in my forensic pathology fellowship. That's great. Like, and have you ever testified in court? Uh, how people died is the job. The so. forensic and anatomical pathology? Yes. But I get approximately it. how many times? More than 50 times. I don't great. know if he's also uh, a special and prosecutor. Have you rendered opinions or if he's a in, uh, regular in prior cases uh, in, regarding homicide? He's always a prosecutor. Guns? Yes. All right. And um, does this include testifying to the entry and exit of gunshot wounds? Yes. Not all prosecutors um, do Honor, homicide cases. The court to recognize uh, Dr. Depending Gerald on the as an expert witness in the fields of forensic and anatomical pathology. Yes. Doc, we like your necklace. I like your Thank necklace. You. I can't speak um, for everybody. Dr. I like Joel, your necklace, Doc. Would you explain to the jury exactly what is an autopsy? We are at 1.25. An autopsy 25. examination consists ultimately of two parts, both an oh, external got examination Yay. and an internal examination. In the external examination, we... We document, you know, features of the pretty empty. such as hair color, eye color, weight, and stature. But we also document any injuries that we see externally. We take measurements of those injuries and we classify those injuries. The second part of the autopsy is the internal examination. I also neglected to mention that during the external they examination, literally we take collect, out um, trace evidence. They literally take out all the organs cases. and weigh them. That they take out your brain and weigh it. They take out samples. everything. The internal examination it's consists of watch. blood collection for toxicology when applicable and looking at every internal organ individually every single one. to look for injury. And again, classifying that in type of injury and also looking for natural disease findings. We also make um, microscopic slides as a result of that, we're at 1.25, which is why which it sounds like she's by looking through a microscope galloping through this and testimony. Form a, a final report with the ultimate goal of determining the cause and the manner of death. Thank you. And does every person who the died cause and the manner of death here is going to be no. homicide? So what? What? Um, how do you determine whether or not you're going to perform an autopsy? Is it needed? An autopsy. Uh, I'll, I'll back up and and explain that a little bit more. Um, within the state of New Mexico, I'll, I'll back up the and OMI is notified of Medical all sudden examiners. and unexpected deaths. And for cases that are non-natural, there are certain circumstances where the OMI will take jurisdiction. And so in the case of deaths resulting from gunshot wounds, uh, this is an example. 
where the OMI or the Office of the Medical Investigator will take jurisdiction. And I don't know. The ME finding shouldn't be accident in this homicides, case. Homicides. Um, the the OMI. We're, we'll see what her finding is. The um, here's what I say, and I saw you guys chatting about it in the chat. The reason the finding shouldn't be accident in this case, and I will be very surprised if it is, and if it is, I'll be surprised. Um, because this was not accidental. This was a shooting. It was a death at the hands of another. Now, while the shooting may be accidental, um, I don't think Baldwin intended for there to be a bullet and a gun. The ME doesn't decide that accidental deaths are, does she say accident? Well, some of you guys are ahead. That's odd to me. Accidents are reserved for things like car accidents and falling down stairs and falling off a roof, um, like natural accidents. Um, shootings and at the hands of another is the, um, she does testify why she classifies it an accident. Shootings at the hand of another are at the hand of another is the homicide component of the Emmy finding. So I guess we'll see. Um, I guess we'll see, but that's, that would be odd to me. And, um, that is definitely when I worked in Los Angeles County at the hands of another, even if at the hands of another was not a volitional homicide the emmy rules it as a homicide and the da's office then decides if there's the mens rea to charge it as a criminal homicide because the cause of deaths are going to be natural accidental um self-inflicted homicide and unknown all right let's keep going. i will perform an autopsy thank you um can you explain to us what is the intake process when when a body arrives at OMI? What she is shouldn't, that Carol, process Carla. Like? She shouldn't be thinking of uh, intent. When a body arrives at the OMI, manner the body of is death received in a in a sealed body bag at the hands of another. So equal chain homicide. of custody is maintained from the scene to the OMI um, to ensure that no one's tampered with anything inside the so, body bag. We'll talk about that more. Um, I want to hear what she the says. Seal and we I haven't been watching have, in advance. Um, a machine at the OMI called CT scanner, just like in a hospital if you have to get a CAT scan. And the body at the OMI receives a full body CT yes, scan. Yes, this is the corner. This allows us to have a look inside the body before we actually open the body. For gunshot wound cases, it lets us know if there's a gunshot wound track and if there is a retained projectile. And so that is a, um, the beginning of the intake process. What coffee do I Thanks. have? And, and I'm going to get into some greater detail about the CT scan in this case and further questions. Um, but right now, Describe to us with, as part of the intake process. Do is it typical for sometimes for um, items to arrive? Today along I'm with wearing lawless yes. lip gloss. So what what might what might arrive with one of my um, per our state Gerard statute? Anything present on the body pencils. should come with the body. Um, in this case, there were personal color. belongings that included clothing um, that came present with Miss Hutchins body. Great. Um, do you gather any statements? So uh, sorry for your loss, Jenny. Autopsy? If law enforcement That's, is some of these present to view an autopsy, hard. which is not uncommon, um, I will usually ask if they have any questions before I start. And I will communicate autopsy findings to anyone who is there to view autopsy. Um, we also, before I issue causing the of death, when relevant, hey, we'll review law enforcement reports. So you mentioned kind of the external examination. Is there another step to the autopsy process? There is the internal examination. Right. And can you explain what that is briefly? During the internal examination, uh, we make an incision on the chest and the abdomen to look at the internal organs. Uh, we also make an incision on the head and remove part of the skull to to look at the brain. Um, as part of the external examination, I don't think what, the defense what knows sort of things are you looking for. Maybe always what witnesses are going to be up, but on the external Hannah's examination, been wearing black again, each day. we're I think looking it's appropriate at um, for the trial for her to wear certain black each physiological day. characteristics of the or physical characteristics of the decedent, but we're also looking for any injuries that might be present and again we take measurements of those and we classify what type of injury they are and how do you document the external examination the external examination um, is documented i typically use a, a body diagram and i make notes if there's any tattoos i'll document where those are um, and uh -huh. then if there's any injuries i'll document on the body diagram. learned that my first day as a law clerk for and the da's office as part of this yes they document they all the tattoos um, and let's talk now a little bit in a little bit more my detail tattooed about friends, the, the internal examination. Like me. Um, how do you You can always be like, my job is to make it hard for the coroner to document all my tattoos. Do you, how much detail do you I want? I can't say I um, have Just to give you an idea in terms of, you know, are you looking for consider um, that. whether the death was caused by an injury versus a natural disease? Just kind of a high level description of what you're looking for. Yes. The, the combination of the external examination and the internal examination are looking at any documented natural disease or injuries. Um, if there are injuries, do they account for death? 
Is there any natural disease that accounts for death? And again, when we perform toxicology, is there any toxicological cause of death or contributory factors to death? And as part of that, do you ever collect samples of tissue or fluids? Yes. She said and that. Can you explain that process. I'm yes, half listening and she said that. Collect blood uh, to perform toxicology to, in certain cases to determine if that caused death or contributed to death. All right. uh, as I mentioned before, we also collect hair samples other blood samples that could be used for DNA testing uh, if needed later. And we collect fingernails, uh, clippings for what we call a so-called homicide workup. Perfect. Um, and was an autopsy performed on Helena Hutchins in this case? Yes. And who conducted that, au that autopsy? I did. Great. What was the date of that autopsy? The autopsy was performed on October 22nd, 2021. Great. The day and after. How did you identify the decedent as Helena Hutchins? The day after the shooting. Uh, I believe she was identified by a, a visual identification. We can also do um, comparison to identification. No, um, I just like want to know what you license. did. And what was your role in this particular autopsy? I don't want to know what you can do. Um, I, I was the know person who did in this case. The full autopsy. So I'm the person who did the external examination and the internal examination, wrote the report, and certified cause and manner of death. Great. So autopsies it was you who was weird. ultimately responsible for issuing the findings? Yes. Great. Um, did you review all of the photographs uh, related to the autopsy to form your opinion? Yes. Thank you. Um, were you able to render an opinion regarding the cause and manner of death uh, for Mrs. Hutchins? Yes. And what was your conclusion for cause of death? A death was caused by a gunshot wound to the chest. And what was the manner of death? I certified the manner of death as accident. And can you explain why you classified Yeah, I'm going to need a, yes. a lot of explanation, ma'am. I classify the manner of death as accident. Well, let me lift me back up to go to a homicide is classified as um, a volitional act caused by another to cause fear, harm, or death. Intent is not always needed. It is a common element, but is not always needed. That is not how every con for an accident. I'm just going to say that is not how every coroner's office defines homicide as cause of death. Like that is not that is not what every uh, that is not how every ME's office defines homicide, which is so surprising to me. A lot of ME's office define homicide as death at the hands of the, of another, which is where you see the inverse of this. You see the coroner rules something a homicide, and the DA's office choose not to prosecute. Um, so accident being accidental things like car accident, um, at the hands of another, even though a car accident could technically be at the hands of another, but those are collisions, but at the hands of another being at the hands of another, he pulled the trigger. So it's unusual to me that the kind of national standard that I've seen across different jurisdictions is just not what New Mexico does. We learn new things about jurisdictions all the time, but this is definitely not um, definitely not how I've seen homicide as manner of death, but I am not the medical examiner in New Mexico. Odd to me. The applicable, what must, what's, what must not be present. We're gonna, we're gonna just back up and let you explain this more because this, this shit's odd to me, but. Caused by a gunshot wound to the chest. And okay, the New Mexico. I certified the manner of death as accident. And can you explain why you classified yep. it as an accident? Yes. I classify the manner of death as accident. Well, let me lift me back up to go to a homicide is classified as um, a volitional act caused by another to cause fear, harm, or death. Intent is not always needed. It is a common element, but is not always needed. Um, conversely, for an accident to be applicable, what must, what's, what must not be present is an intent um, to cause fear, harm, or death. Looking at the uh, material that was available I've, to I've, I know I'm harping. I've literally never seen the ME's office try to determine intent when somebody comes in. Like, I've never, I've just never seen it. I've just never seen it. Um, so it's odd to me. Riley Yates in the chat said, in my master's program for medical forensics, we were taught that this is not the definition of a homicide. This would be a homicide. Um, this would be a homicide in my coursework. Riley, in everything I've seen in every case as I've worked, this would be considered a homicide. It's a very unusual definition of homicide for the Emmys to try to determine intent. Normally that is determined later by the investigation and by the prosecution. Again, this is her standards. That's fine. This She is doing her job. We don't live there, but it's just weird to me. It's just weird to me. It's just weird. To, it's just weird to me, and I don't like it. 
<laughs> Why? Because I'm old and I'm used to doing things differently. The way I'm going to text Judge Abby. He through law enforcement reports. It was apparent to me there was no obvious intent to cause death. How do you know it that? Doesn't mean there's no negligence or so on. How do you know there that? There was no intent to cause How do you death. determine? Are you the investigator? Um, there are medical examiners across this country that would have certified the manner of death in this case as homicide. Uh -huh. However, reviewing the material. Yup. <laughs> I, I appreciate, I do appreciate that she knows that this is outside of the norm, like very outside of the norm. Um, they do review police reports. They do review what happens. It's just odd. It's just that was applicable to me. It the is way I'm going to message every prosecutor I know. There was a belief on the set that the firearm was not loaded with live ammunition. Correct. And based on that belief and this scenario being much different than what we see in other medical examiner cases for firearm related deaths. I felt that the manner of death was best class classified as accident. I and don't thirdly, think you determine there has intent, though. I don't think been that's somewhat a of a precedent set in a previous movie set shooting death uh, where the manner of death was classified as accident. That was an accident. There so wasn't a live round um, on that you set. That, you, you, setting pre it's too early, Emily. Setting precedent in the movie industry is different. That was an unclean barrel and blanks. That is a very that is a very different situation than here. That's also California. That I appreciate that she is defending her her answer and response. I am surprised by it, but um, it it I'm going to need to message the corners. I know this this is outside of the boundaries, and I don't think Emmys. I don't think they use precedent that way. It's just an odd situation. Your, uh, when you first started your testimony huh. that you sometimes perform a, perform a CT scan um, on the decedent's body. It's odd. Did you perform one in this case? Yes. And what did that scan reveal? Um, it's just odd. Scan it's odd to me. That there was no significant think... natural disease for Ms. Hutchins. Me, the it coroner's also just going to be some easy testimony. Track. Me, what um, the fuck is happening? That there was a medical intervention Three minutes prior to later. her death in the form of surgical intervention that was conducted at UNMH or, or the University of New Mexico Hospital. And it also demonstrated that there was no retained projectile within Ms. Hutchins' body. Thank you. Uh, when, when Ms. Hutchins first arrived at OMI, do you recall what she was wearing? She was wearing um, undergarments and she was wrapped in a hospital blanket. Okay. Did any um, clothing arrive with uh, with her? Yes. And do you, do you recall what that was? Yes, there was a, a jacket, or I classified it as being a jacket. And there was also a pair of, of um, tights and a pair of pants. Great. Um, at this time, Your Honor, I'd like to move for admission of states exhibits 113 and 114. I don't think I've ever seen a shooting. By defense counsel. I don't think I've ever seen a shooting categorized <laughs> yes. as a as a accidental death. I just don't think I have. Okay. They end up showing her. I'm sure they're going to show some of her clothing. We talked about that at the beginning. Um, it is a it is an involuntary manslaughter case. We're going some of that's going to happen. Miss um, Bodie in the chat said, "Isn't that a legal conclusion? It's not because what the coroner does is not binding on what the DA does. Is, it's is just there an, an image on your screen. Yes, it's okay. just an odd. Um, does that appear to be the jacket that arrived with Miss Hutchins? Yes. It's just an odd way to did do you it. Do any examination of this jacket for me? I did a, a visual inspection. And and why did you do that? Um, for firearm-related fatalities, we look for uh, defects of the clothing that Which correspond to any gunshot wounds on the body. Um, in particular, we will look at the defect that corresponds to the gunshot entrance wound, and we look for visible soot or dark particulate material um, that would help us indicate a range of fire. And, and did you find any of that on this jacket? No. Okay. And so what, does, what kind of conclusion can you draw from the absence of gunpowder or that kind of thing. The absence of soot, unburned gunpowder particles, and gunpowder stippling so um, on the clothing and or body would indicate a distant or or an indeterminate range of fire. Indeterminate range of fire would be applicable if there is an intermediate target, meaning that the projectile went through something else before it struck Ms. Hutchins. Um, there was no indication that the projectile went through anything before it struck Ms. Hutchins, and therefore the, the range of fire is best classified as distant. And, and just to be clear, when, when you say distant, can you can you put some um, 
some actual measurements to that, uh, perhaps in feet? It's difficult to say, but what we generally say very conservatively is that to get the best idea of the actual distance of the firearm to uh, Ms. Hutchins' body, we looking at clothes helps. Do looking at a um, examination or looking um, at the body helps. Um, sorry, the word has left me. Um, a firearm test where you test the actual firearm with the actual ammunition um, to try to get the, the range of fire. However, generally speaking, uh, in forensic pathology, we can estimate that distance roughly to be about two feet or greater. Two feet or greater. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, if you look at your monitor, I put up uh, States Exhibit 114. Um, do you recognize these? Yes. And what are they? Um, these are the pants that were received along with Ms. Hutchins' body. And were, were you able to make any findings or determinations on the basis of these pants? There were no defects that were significant. The, the clothing had been uh, partially cut. I'm just going to pause real quick. And I've seen a lot of people in the chat uh, talk about this. I think, I think this Emmy looked at the reports that nobody thought live rounds are on set and thought that it was um, with her definition of homicide, th her definition of homicide included an intent to harm another. And I have not seen any evidence here that there was intent to harm another. So given her definition of homicide and her logic, her finding makes sense. The definition I have seen a lot of coroners use is um, at the hands of another non-accidental accidental generally falling into the car accident category. Um, but I guess you could argue that that would be non-volitional. She's arguing that this is non-volitional. So she categorized it as an accident because she is saying it was a non-volitional killing. However, uh, from all the evidence they have at the beginning, Alec Baldwin pointed a weapon at somebody and pulled the trigger. Even if he didn't think it was loaded, it still is a volitional act. So it it gets into like the legal definitions and the medical definitions. And under her medical definition, I understand how she came to that conclusion. I'm just surprised by it. Larissa Kinley said, Emily, why would an accidental misfire of a firearm be classified as a homicide? Um, sorry, just confused. Don't ever say sorry for asking questions. We're here to talk about cases. Um, this is not an accidental discharge. Baldwin cocked the gun, pulled the trigger and fired it. He just didn't think there was a bullet in it because there should never be a bullet in it, but it wasn't an accidental discharge. So it's it's interesting to see her logic given her, given her definition of homicide for her office. Cuts oh. due to resuscitative efforts. Um, it's there's nothing significant to me. Um, from my point of view with regard to the So I'm surprised they determined it as an accident, but. Okay, this is not and, uh, an easy case to prove the gun, for the prosecutors. Wounds. Let's talk about that. How many gunshot wounds were there? There were two. Entry and exit. Um, what injuries were you able to observe um, externally? I didn't think I would lose there my mind about this this early in the morning. I'm going to take a deep breath and have some right more caffeine. Armpit region, and there was a gunshot exit wound on Ms. Hutchins' back just below the left scapula or the left shoulder blade area. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move for admission of state's exhibits 115, 116, and 117. Sealed? Um, these have also been stipulated to by defense counsel. Are they sealed? Right, they should minute. be sealed. You may I publish those? Yes. Oh, then those must not be the autopsy photos. They might be the autopsy diagrams. Dr. Gerald, what are we looking at here? This is a photograph before Ms. Hutchins' body was cleaned, uh, which I typically do. If they, I, my hand is on, wounds. my hand is on my, why I do this is because they better not like publish this to us. Off. And so I like to take photographs Thank before you, the wound is clean that demonstrates that there is no soot surrounding the entrance wound. But what is depicted in this photograph is a gunshot entrance wound in the right armpit region surrounding the entrance wound um, is an abrasion or a scratch um, that is likely due to the positioning of Ms. Hutchins' arm when she was um, when she was shot. And so that's just an abrasion that was caused by the, by the projectile as it entered the armpit area. Thank you. And you also mentioned um, an exit wound. Um, can you explain what this photograph is? Guys, give me yes, one this is second. a gunshot exit wound. Ah, which was wrong way. left of the midline, left of Ms. Hutchins' midline on her back below the um, below the left shoulder blade. Um, it does show, and this is again before it has been cleaned, um, which again is a standard practice, but this is the exit wound. It has some bruising around the exit wound that was probably caused by uh, medical intervention and, and placement of, of a plastic um, um, device to help render medical aid. Thank you. I'm gonna pull up uh, State's Exhibit 117 and this may uh, help, help you explain. I know you tried to explain where the exit wound was in terms of her back, so this may uh, give the jury a little bit better idea of where that was. 
Um, the, the, but just to be clear, this is the same exit wound as from the previous picture, correct? Yes. And do you notice anything uh, different or remarkable in this picture that you didn't already discuss in the previous one? No, it just gives a better orientation. Great, thank you. Hey, chat, I'm back. I'm imagining that they are up at sidebar, but autopsy photos are rough. Like really, really rough. Uh, let's see, we're gonna zoom, zoom through this because they are up at sidebar. All right, um, Dr. Gerald, based um, on the examination and your review of the photographs, were you able to track the path of the projectile from where it entered Ms. Hutchins' chest and, and where it exited? Yes. And can you explain that path? Yes, the projectile, entered through the right armpit area. It missed the major blood vessels in the, in the shoulder area and in the arm. It entered the right aspect of the chest into the right chest cavity. It injured some of the blood vessels that travel along the ribs, broke um, some ribs or broke one rib, Ooh. went into the right lung and exited the left, excuse me, the right chest cavity, just adjacent to the vertebral column. It went through the spinal cord Vertebral and traveled through the soft tissue of the back before I pronounced shit weird too, but and as part of that examination, it's I don't always see um, a bro and again I haven't done three thousand autopsies like she has. Don't always see broken ribs. It reminds you the fact that there are broken ribs from this gunshot wound reminds you just a how large the forty five caliber round is and how close Baldwin was when he pulled the trigger. Um, the broken ribs are an indication of how big that was. With smaller rounds, you will see nicking on the bone or a chip on the bone. I've had somebody um, shot in the face and the bullet penetrated the skin, but not their skull because of the thick, literally the hardness, the thickness of their skull uh, with smaller rounds. But it's a reminder of how large and powerful this round is and how close they were. And did you use what's called a trajectory rod? Yes. And, and what does that help you? Those are weird do? to see too. The trajectory rod um, just simply shows the pathway, the general pathway. The photos are that weird. The it's took it's through all kind of weird. Um, from the point of entrance to the point of exit. It's helpful. And that trajectory with respect to Ms. Hutchins' body is front to back, right to left, and downward. And were the injuries that Ms. Hutchins suffered to her internal organs consistent with being shot? Yes. Um, and of the... Uh, of the injuries that you described, which of those can be lethal? There was documented in a medical record, there was over one liter of blood present in the right chest cavity when Ms. Hutchins arrived to UNMH or the University of New Mexico Hospital. And so that indicates significant blood loss within the chest cavity and the injury to the right lung was also lethal. Thank you. And uh, I know you mentioned uh, earlier that you took sam tissue samples for toxicology testing, is that correct? Yes. And what were the results of those toxicology tests? The toxicology was negative for alcohol and common drugs of abuse. Okay. Nothing further. And that's what's needed. Yes, I've got this at 1.25. I don't know what much he's going to cross-examine her on other than morning, verifying that this is an accident. Doctor, I first want to ask you about your classification. Now, you've been doing autopsies, and you said, I think, 33,000 or 3,500? Yes, 3,500. Interesting. 3, how long, how many years have you done autopsies? I came to the OMI straight out of fellowship in August of 2014. Okay, so 10 years. Yes. And you are very familiar with the classification system, whether it be a homicide or accident, correct? Yes. And in this case, you ruled the cause and manner of death to be accident. Yes. And in a homicide, your definition you gave was a, to rule it a homicide, it has to be a volitional act caused by another to cause death, correct? Yes. And volitional means purposeful? No. What does volitional mean? Volitional just mean well, volitional means a voluntary act. It doesn't mean that there is in it, it doesn't. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, uh, excuse me. A voluntary act meaning pulling a trigger like. Like that. 
doesn't always mean there's intent. You don't need intent. So something as simple as pulling a trigger could be the volitional act. That's why I'm so case, confused. Reports, and you got information. And based on that, your determination was that this was an accident. Yes. And when you uh, said accident, I think you described that as what must not be present is intent to cause death. There should no be there should not be intent to cause fear, harm or death. Okay. That's correct. So in, in the materials you read and the information you reviewed, you did not find an intent to cause death by, by anybody. That's correct. Okay. I and agree with that. With regard to that classification, it was still volitional that is an official um, state of New Mexico ruling, correct? Yes. OK. And. AC, I disagree. It's Baldwin's action that we're talking about. Uh, Baldwin's action was volitional. We're not talking about Baldwin's action is the only action considered for this um, because Baldwin's action, he didn't drop the weapon. He cocked the weapon and pulled the trigger. So that is volitional. That is an accident. Hannah's yes. action doesn't matter for I this know determination. Your notes that you documented the approximate time of the incident was about 1348. Is that correct? Yes. And that is 148? Yes. Okay. And then you documented that Ms. Hutchins arrived at the hospital approximately 1520. Is that right? Yes. And that is 320. Yes. Now, that is approximately an hour and a half delay. Is that right? Yes. And you the knew relevance that she was being attended to by EMT personnel and there was a helicopter. They have to, to prove to someone hospital. died. Is that right? Yes. Do you so that's have why any idea why there was a delay in the it's hospital a, taking her? We're yeah. still in a manslaughter now, case. During your so you have to findings, you died. did a CT scan before your external examination, correct? Yes. Did you find evidence of prior Same medical intervention? Same ME from the on both cases. Yes. And what was that evidence of medical intervention? Uh, she um, had been intubated. Uh, the intubation was actually in the wrong place. It was in the esophagus. It was removed when she arrived at the hospital. Nancy, I don't know if she told law enforcement that. Into her esophagus and so not into the airway. Because law enforcement, initial law enforcement on the scene said Baldwin pulled the trigger. And those talking on the on scene said Baldwin pulled the trigger. Um, she had also had surgical intervention. So they had opened up the chest cavities on both sides due to the presence of a gunshot wound. They had also opened up the protective covering surrounding the heart to try to do what they call a manual cardiac massage to restart the heart. Um, it's my understanding that she was pulseless upon arrival. It sounds and like she didn't have enough breathing. blood. You said that she had a, that. an intubation and another intubation. Is that right? Yes. And they were both in the esophagus. Yes. Now, an esophageal intubation can be a dangerous situation, correct? Uh, it's, it's an ineffective um, way to respirate someone or to establish air. And in fact, can, can that potentially cause um, an anoxic situation, a lack of oxygen to the brain? Well, the injury itself is what causes the anoxic situation, but the intubation into the esophagus isn't um, isn't giving adequate airway establishment. Because, um, doctor, uh, when you do the intubation, you're trying to get it into the bronchus, correct? Yes. Who the intubated bronchus, her? Can you tell the jury what the bronchus is? The, the bronchus, the main stem bronchus is the main airway that goes to both lungs. It eventually divides into a left and right bronchus, and it goes to each lung. And so by putting it in the esophagus, that is basically sending uh, oxygen into the stomach. Yes. Yep. And um, part of your notes, I know you indicated that Ms. Hutchins was complaining of shortness of breath. Yes. And so an intubation into her esophagus would not have assisted with that, with helping her to get that oxygen. That's correct. She did um, have. Did you also find on your CT examination that ribs. there was a chest needle that was tried to put in? They attempt to. I don't think they talked about the condition of her lungs, but I imagine shortness of breath made sense. They attempted to put in a central line, um, which means you're trying to get fluid to in the, in the most effective. At the end of the day, the way they intubated her or not, I I don't know if the defense will get there in cross. No spoilers, but we'll see. I don't think if they had intubated her properly, it would have um, changed the outcome necessarily in this case way possible um, because of her situation they had to put blood products directly into her heart and did that based on your review that CT exam so it looked blood. like it did not go in properly uh, no it was in the it was in the heart oh it was they... I, I believe it was okay um, so that wasn't a shallow insertion um, I well I couldn't tell that based on the autopsy or the CT okay so the esophageal intubation do you know who performed that do you know who did that I do not the C so we CPR don't know. efforts you observed, do you know who performed those? Um, not off the top of my head, no. I would have to... There were medics There were medics from the movie set on scene. 
there were EMS that arrived on scene and then there was the life flight crew that arrived on scene before they took her to the hospital. So um, they don't know, They she does not know who who did what medically. Do the medical records? Based on everything that you saw as a medical doctor, had this not taken an hour and a half, had Ms. Hutchins received more timely medical intervention, could she have possibly survived these wounds? That's difficult for me to answer that question um, because I'm not a I'm not a doctor who treats gunshot wounds in the chest, um, and I have a very skewed view regarding the lethality of gunshot wounds. So that's outside my purview. I when you were interviewed, didn't you say she possibly could have survived? Potentially, but I'm not the best person to ask for that question because I don't treat patients. Okay, but you previously had said that you yes. acknowledged that. Okay, thank you, Honor. I have nothing further. I wonder why they're approaching, but she did say um, previously that with better medical inter inter intervention, she could have survived. Again, they're not here to try a medical malpractice case. They are not here to determine um, anything other than the fact that Helena Hutchins died of a gunshot wound, because that's really all that's relevant here. So there's not much more that's relevant. I don't know if the jury had a question and that's why the judge called them up. We're gonna zoom, zoom through some of this so we can get to the next witness. Their sidebars can take a minute. Um, uh, Dr. Gerald, what was your determination as to the cause of death of Helena Hutchins? Her death was caused by a gunshot wound of the chest. Thank you. And um, you said that you performed this autopsy on okay. October 22nd, is that correct? Yes. And her date of death was October 21st, is that correct? Yes. So you had approximately one day's worth of investigative materials available for you to review, is that correct? Yes. That's a good follow-up okay. question. All right, thank you, you're excused. That's a good uh, follow up. Order, the uh, photographer Seals. is not allowed to uh, publish any of the OMI pictures. Those uh, that doesn't those are the autopsy photos, the three exhibits of the autopsy, and that's um, the order is either direct or or picking up it indirectly. These are things Court TV knows not to show autopsy photos. Um, nobody needs to see them. If you haven't had to see autopsy photos in your life, you don't need to see them. Um, but I would appreciate if the judge stated it before, but there was no media in the courtroom today. Really interesting. There's All right, none. Next witness. Uh, the state calls Stephen Bohr. Stephen Bohr. Stephen, if you're boring, the chat is not going to ever, ever survive today. Um, and I've seen a number of questions about. Do you swear? Do you swear or affirm Mr. under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, we'll talk oh, about it at a break. Seat, talk into the microphone. Don't worry, we'll we'll get there. Um, I don't think Hannah's seen the ME photos before. I don't know if they would have shown them to her. It's hard stuff. It's not. They're not Sir, easy. Go ahead and, uh, state your name for the record. My name is Stephen Orr. Oh, or are you currently? Or I'm with the San Diego County Sheriff's Office. Stephen Orr. Not Stephen Bohr. Uh, this was a great question, Jen Jay. So the jury can't directly ask the witness questions, only give it to the judge and then the judge and the lawyers and then they ask questions. Yes, that's exactly how the process would work. Because sometimes the jury might want to ask a question that could elicit um, evidence that is not proper evidence. They could ask, well, what did this person tell that person? That would be hearsay. So if the jury wants to ask a question, it goes to the judge. The judge um, will talk to the lawyers generally about it and then ask the witness the question. And Mr. Orr, what position do you hold at the San Pequeno Sheriff's Office? I'm currently assigned to the Civil Division. Uh, how long have you been employed there? In the Civil Division or with the Sheriff's Office? With the Sheriff's Office. Uh, just over 15 years. And do you have law enforcement experience prior to going to the San Pequeno Sheriff's Office? Yes, I'm retired from the Albuquerque Police Department. I'm going to have to slow you down, how sir. How long were you with the Albuquerque Police Department? Uh, from I and couldn't understand him, so I had to slow him down, which is really for me. Did you become involved in this case somehow? Yes. How did you become involved in this case? On uh, October 28th of uh, 2021 at about 3.01 p.m., um, Sergeant Chris, I, for whatever reason, I was at the office. I don't recall the reason why I was at the office that day. Um, <laughs> Hello, ladies Sergeant, and gentlemen. Uh, Chris Zook found me in the I was office. At the office. Uh, he knows uh, my firearms background and uh, asked me to take a look at a rifle that they were having trouble clearing. What are you, what, what's your firearms background? Uh, I became a firearms instructor in 1991. Um, currently a master firearms instructor in, in law enforcement um, with handgun, rifle, uh, patrol rifle, and shotgun. Um, 
I'm a master uh, hunter education instructor. I became a, a hunter, edu hunter education instructor in uh, 2000, currently a master instructor um, for hunter education. I'm an armor and Glock pistol, um, AR-15 platform rifle, bolt action rifle, and police shotgun. You know a little bit about guns. A little bit. Um, on October, well, no, I think it was maybe October 27th. On October 27th, uh, were you asked to assist with this case? Um, I, well, I thought it was the 28th, but it maybe, could, could have been the 27th. But it I, might have but, been the 28th that you got involved. That I got involved, yes, because uh, um, at the, the scene of this incident, I was not involved. I just, once again, happened to be at the office that day. Um, and Sergeant Zook, knowing my background, just simply asked for some assistance. Okay, I'm going to show you what has been previously entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 10. Kathy, I see your comment in the chat. A, I hope you recover well. B, I, shoot I'm me an email. I'm not seeing it on the other monitors. Uh, the emails are public there oh, in sorry. my link. Uh, it's already been entered in it. In, and the mods can find so it. We can publish it. We'll find Let's it. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, Deborah, no, I'm not going to quit interrupting. Do you um, recognize that? There's plenty of channels that don't yeah, have a uh, commentary. A moment before, so you, yes. you don't have it in front of you? No, ma'am. I don't give a shit if you have it in front of you or not. Can somebody find the exhibit? So no, I'm not going to quit interrupting. That's uh, that's like exactly the entire thing I do. Okay. Here. Yes, I, yes, ma'am. Do you recognize that? I do. Um, where did that come from and how did, how did you ah, end up? Uh, the lever session? action. Uh, once again, I was I was at the office. I'm going to keep I saying pump the reason action, but the lever the action. Time. I don't recall the reason why I was at the office that day. Um, Sergeant Zook, who Susan was at is the glad time that Deborah has now made the same comment, vision, asked me to take a look at this rifle. Apparently, it, uh, there were there were some cartridges that were stuck in the gun. Because they were the uh, wrong size. He didn't know how to clear it, so he asked me to clear it for him. So, what uh, to answer your question? What I'm looking at here is a Henry Patton Allen Arms. Uh, 40 I mean, it is cool lever looking. Action rifle. So let me ask you. Um, I can see why the they would use it in the jammed? Western. It was jammed, yes. Why was the gun jammed? Well, first of all, let me explain the difference between a, a jam <laughs> and a malfunction. Okay, a, mal a malfunction no. is something that can be readily cleared by, by the operator of the firearm. A jam is something that's going to take uh, an armor or possibly even a gunsmith to, to take it apart. What happened with this particular firearm here, there was a, uh, a cartridge of the wrong size, the wrong diameter. Um, entered into the, uh, the tubular magazine of the gun. And as Sergeant Zook was trying to uh, uh, eject the rounds, probably by, and I'm only they guessing because I wasn't there, um, by he testified moving already. the lever action back and forth to uh, eject the rounds from the gun. Can you picture uh, it? He was like. <laughs> round of the wrong caliber wouldn't chamber into, uh, into the firearm, so then it couldn't be ejected. So did the gun jam because sergeant zook was manipulating the lever action or did it jam because there was a wrong caliber That's bullet in there or cartridge rather well the cartridge wouldn't properly I mean, chamber so since it couldn't leading. properly chamber it couldn't properly eject so that's what caused the jam so the can wrong you explain size round. to the jurors um how that gun would have been able to receive um a, a cartridge of the wrong caliber to begin with Yes. Um, Put it in. Do they have a picture of this gun in front of them? They do. Okay. Um, and your I monitor don't. has arrows and all kinds of stuff. I'm not I'm not an expert. The FBI guy that, fucking okay. rocked right here, the arrows. Um, you'll see, it was so I, I good. Yeah. Use the, uh, the arrow here. The, the technology was really helpful to put the arrows on the pictures and circle stuff. I thought that was great. The FBI dude was like, I've got this shit nailed. Okay. Um, the entire point of this dude's testimony is going to be that the wrong size or the wrong caliber round was loaded into the lever action rifle. The only reason this matters in this case, this, this absolutely happened in the Murdoch case, absolutely happened in the Murdoch case. The only reason it matters in this case is because they are trying to prove that Hannah was reckless in doing her job. And if she is reckless in doing her job, where else can we see that she's reckless? less other than um putting in a live round into a revolver that's on set and loading the wrong caliber ammunition into this 
uh, I would keep wanting to say pump, but this lever action rifle is another example of Hannah not doing her job. That's the entire point of this testimony because the other gun guy from Santa Fe was like, I didn't know how to clear it. I needed to call this person to clear it. That's all. This will be pretty quick testimony. There's a lever right here that you can see, and you move this lever forward, all right, to the front Objection. portion. Yes. Why are we approaching? He's drawing on the shaft. Wait, that's not called the shaft. The barrel. It's the barrel. I, I didn't know they were going to approach, or I would have just talked over them approaching. The way this gun is loaded, all right, there, you can see right here this little, little tab, okay? It's held back by spring tension. You overcome spring tension by moving it forward. She's the armor. And the front of this gun here has about the oh, last three or four inches will rotate sideways, opening up what's called a tubular magazine. All right. Um, for la a tubular magazine, for lack of a better term, is like a fat metal straw. Okay. And the, the cartridges okay. can be dropped down into that tubular magazine. Now, the diameter of the magazine tube is wide enough to accommodate slightly larger than caliber the barrels not. ammunition and that is what happened in this case that Once makes the, sense uh, the tubular magazine is loaded then the four end uh, or the four portion of the of the uh muzzle is closed up and the the rifle can be cycled by lever action and what you have down here is the lever action which um basically is the good use of, of arrow the my guy lever action i like it so the 45 caliber cartridge was fit in that did you call it a loading tube or it's a, a tubular magazine tubular magazine uh, as opposed the to the 45, ones that like... because it was the wrong caliber was was too large to cycle through correct correct okay done um and were you brought in to fix this gun and make it safe yes and were you able to do that? Yes. Um, are, how can this gun be unloaded once cartridges are put in the tubular magazine? Well, there are two ways to unload this gun. Okay. The first one is what I'm guessing that Sergeant Zook did. Okay. And all he did was he this testified lever already right here that I, that I have pointed to. Okay. So. You work it back and forth in a lever action type motion. All right, and I can go through the mechanics of the gun, but the simple answer is through mechanical uh, linkage, the unlike Murda though, from the unlike Murda, unlike Murda, the attorneys aren't wandering around the courtroom holding on to the guns, which in this case would have been a very bad look. Um, that's why they're doing pictures, and he's trying to explain with his hands. In the Murda case, they would have just brought the thing in, and somebody would have been standing in court, lever actioning it. I'm glad they didn't enter into the chamber. I think that would make everyone uh, nervous. And then the extractor will pull the, Amy Z, the, thank uh, you for the round out membership. of the chamber and kick it out of the gun. So depending on the number of rounds you have in the tubular magazine, if you have five rounds, in theory, you run the action five times and all five rounds will, will kick out of the gun, will be ejected from the gun. The other way to, to unload this gun and the way I ended up unloading this gun Hello, is Lanana. once again, I showed you this little lever right here. I'm sure it's Pulled very it early forward. in Australia. The front barrel of the gun will rotate to the side and exposing the top part of this metal metal fat straw that I, that I explained to you. All right, you turn the gun upside down, for lack of a better term, and, the, and gravity is your friend, the rounds fall out. Gravity is your friend, Bob's your uncle. Thank you, sir. Away we go. Witness. Kay West said, question, why is this important? She's the armorer. The wrong size round was in the gun. They're trying to prove she was reckless in doing her job. If she's loading the wrong size rounds into the gun and she's loading live bullets into the gun, it it further establishes that she is reckless in doing her job. This is the new defense attorney who came in yesterday. We're going to talk about where the fuck Mr. Bullion is in a minute because that's now on the court's website. Good morning, sir. Good morning. No spoilers. Um, so the the round that was actually in this gun um do you know if this was actually a dummy round that was inside i don't know uh, would there be any danger if it was a dummy round that was inside um if it were a, there was a well if you're, you're describing the two differences between a dummy round and say a um a blank okay but you didn't know one way or the other i did not it know. could have been a dummy round that was could have been a dummy round yes um and it sounds like he's like for my purposes uh, i don't give a shit zook didn't properly unload this gun would you agree with that 
I have no idea because when, uh, I don't know what uh, happened to the gun prior to me putting my hands on it. Um, and I can only describe the configuration the gun is when I got it. And what he already testified. To, prior to, to me taking possession of the gun for that brief period of time, I can't tell you. I just don't know. Well, that came to you because he couldn't figure out it himself, right? Yes. So so he wasn't properly unloading it. Agree? I think he was trying. but I, I... You're trying to assign blame to someone who couldn't unload a jammed gun that he wasn't familiar with. So he tried to unload it properly, realized that he couldn't, and then went to someone he thought could. I don't know what else you're supposed to do. I appreciate you're trying to assign blame, but I don't think there's blame to be assigned here. He was like, the gun is jammed. I don't know how to unjam it. Excuse me, sir. Do you know how to unjam a lever action shotgun? But I would agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he was trying, he couldn't do it, um, but... Isn't this rifle, the way you just described this to the jury, it's pretty easy to unload, isn't it? If the right size um, rounds in it. If you're familiar it. with the firearm, sure. I mean, anything's easy if you know about it um, to, and you don't know until you do. That's a great answer. You just open the rifle and the rounds fall out the bottom, right? Um, well, Not if it's jammed. Front. Or, or they fall out of it once yeah. you open it, right? Yes. Um, and, and you said your involvement in this case was, or in that limited role was because nobody really knew how to take this gun apart, right? Correct. Because okay. it's a lever and you action that shotgun. In the trial interview as well, right? Correct. Now, you don't know who loaded that rifle with that round. I do not. Clear, do you? And you didn't interview any of the multiple people in this case who reportedly loaded firearms? Not his job. No further questions. She, she has a very accusatory tone. Literally, the guy at the sheriff's department got this gun after a shooting on a movie set and couldn't figure it out because he's probably never seen a lever action shotgun before and went to this dude who knows more and was like, can you help? And she's like, it, it's, de it's defense attorney stuff, but I don't know if this witness is the one. I don't think this witness is the one. Redirect. I don't think, no, please, yeah, there's no. So, was this your job? No. If Sergeant Zook attempted to unload the gun by I would object Manipulating the to lever outside action, the scope. As you demonstrated, is that an incorrect way of unloading the gun? No, it's not. That's that. That's a perfectly legitimate way of unloading that gun. Correct. Yes, until the the uh, the incorrect round was attempted to be loaded into the chamber, and then uh, it, up to that point, yes, that was a correct way of unloading the gun. Got stuck. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. Good. Okay, hey. Excused. Next okay. witness. That was a useful redirect. This judge is moving right along. She's like, get your witness on the stand. It looks like the reporters are back. Or at least some of them are back. But again, you square firm under the job of the defense is to poke holes and pass blame on everybody but their client. So that is what she is doing. I think you can pick and choose that a little bit better. But that is the job. Penalty of law that the testimony. She also took this, this case, case on like the, the second the day of trial. Nothing but the truth. Which? All right. Thank you. Have a seat. Talk is a lot. Microphone. Good morning, sir. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Truth hurts. Good morning. My name is Byron is French. Her tone can also be very employed? condescending. I, I am employed by the Rio Rancho Police Department, but I am signed to the FBI's New Mexico Regional Computer Forensics Lab as a task force officer. So are you a sworn law enforcement officer? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you give us some indication of your He's a task force guy. and training uh, with Oh, Victoria, to excellent point. They might have sealed it for the ME. They might uh, have. Yes, ma'am. I'll start when I, I first became a law enforcement officer. I graduated the academy in January of 2011 uh, from the New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy here in Santa Fe. Uh, the first four years I was on patrol, and then the opportunity arose to become a digital forensic examiner at the New Mexico Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory. Uh, I, I got assigned that position. Digital forensics. And it's a, it's a two-year certification process, approximately. Every examiner starts out working Windows computers, doing win, uh, forensics, digital forensics on Windows computers. Is that fun for you? And um, there is the opportunity from there to do digital forensics with cell phones as well. Um, during that, during the initial process, uh, there's there's just the pipelines of training, and then I went through what's called the basic cell phone 
course with the FBI in Huntsville, Alabama back in, I want to say 2017, July of 2017. Uh, from there, I've taken a couple of other different specialty classes when it comes to digital forensics and cell phones. Black Bag offers a uh, Macintosh forensics class. Kate, I will when we, have a, when we get to the morning the break. Apple, um, operating we'll system. We'll talk about Boolean. Uh, from there, I've taken another handful of other courses such as uh, Celebrate. They offer what's called CCO, CCPA, and they are a forensic tool. And what CCO stands right, for sir, Celebrate I Certified Operator. I love operator. all your that is just one background training the course, and experience. And it familiarizes you with the best practices but to extract gonna... data off of mobile devices. The second part of that We're is gonna, CCPA. I would like to get to the it is what Celebrate you Certified at. Physical I don't analyst. need your background. And that teaches uh, you best practices and how to actually go through the data that has been extracted. Fantastic. From there, I have what did taken you uh, other courses where? such as um, a basic cell phone repair class. Uh, sometimes we get these phones in as evidence and they're destroyed. I have the ability to repair them. I've been through advanced training. That's um, cool. ISP like, and uh, JTAG Try to break your ISP, cell phone so, sorry, we can't, so we can't see it. ISP stands for Wrong. in-system programming. And chip off is, is just like it sounds. You, you take the chip off the device. Um, I've also taken what's like called SANS called 585 called Advanced Cell Phone Forensics. And uh, just recently, it's I've like been invited out to become a instructor for Celebrate themselves to instruct that. Oh, cool. Those courses. How did you I, become involved in this case? He's like, I teach this shit. I believe it was back in uh, 2019. Um, was it 2019 or 2020? I'm sorry. I'm 2021. Having, 2021. Sorry. Not enough coffee this morning. Ma'am, you're not allowed to provide the answers, but also from like 2018 on, I don't know if any of us know what year it is. Morning. Uh, back in 2021, I was contacted by Detective Alex Hancock from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office to assist with phone extractions. And did you perform a phone extraction um, on the cell phone belonging to Hannah Gutierrez? I did. What and was the name of that cell phone? What was the name of the cell phone? Did you sorry? Um, tell us a little bit about the the, uh, nope. the extraction that you did, and and wait, what are you wait um, extracting? Wait. Are you extracting text messages? Folks? Did you qualify him as an expert? We we just went through all that background training and experience. Did you qualify him as an expert yet? Those everything give the jurors an idea of what's going on. Sure. So uh, in this instance, I did use the Celebrate program to, to perform an extraction, and there was two extractions involved. One is called a logical and the other one is a file system. And generally um, with those two extractions, you try and extract. Council, can you approach? Yeah. <laughs> Council, can you approach? Is this man an expert or is he just talking about shit? <laughs> Why are they approaching? Sorry for the interruption, sir. That's okay. Um, the court had a question. Pursuant to uh, defense counsel stipulation, uh, will the court recognize Mr. French as an expert in what, what areas are you usually qualified in? Digital forensics. Thank you. Yes, digital forensics. Uh-huh. An expert. Thank you. The court called and them up and was like, an in that area. the court called them up and was like, is this man an expert? Or are we, are we just fucking around? What are we doing? Previously? Yes, ma'am, I have. How many times? Uh, twice, once in the Honorable oh. Martha Vasquez um, courtroom. New expert. Here, and then the other in the Honorable Judge Johnson in Albuquerque, both United States District Courts. Federal Courts. Federal Courts. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, New and, or expert. Uh, at my request, uh, did you uh, review a particular photo? I did. And when we have a chance to answer, to I'll defense answer. Counsel stipulation, I would like to enter into evidence and publish State's Exhibit 118. The judge and I were just thinking the exact same thing. There's this is a special prosecutor. I don't, I have not checked her background. I don't know if she has an extensive background as a prosecutor. There's just a normal order to things, especially when it comes to experts. There's like a normal order you expect. You see that photograph so the judge and I, I were do, both expecting um, the exact same is order same photograph because that that's the order. It was just like, cell phone? yes, it was. And can you uh, tell the jurors? The day and time that this was taken? This was a photo. Uh, without looking exactly at the EXIF data? Photo extracted from Hannah's cell phone. I was talking. Uh, do we have a picture of that by chance or? He wants the EXIF data. So we I were just expecting do. the same order. That would help. I wouldn't want to put it up on that screen. Uh, do, let, let me ask you this. Do the you EXIF the data date doesn't have the phone number. Taken? If memory. Carrie, get the EXIF data. Walk to the expert. Show him the EXIF data. Because if this photo matters enough to be introduced into evidence, then we need to know when it was taken.
serves correctly, I want to say it was around December 21st. And that might not be correct because I was, right. okay. All right, sir. Um, Carrie in the chat is correct, let's Carrie say, in court. Let's take a, I think the year could inform the jury. Uh, but that, Barbara Fett, this is not the DA for New Mexico. This is the special uh, prosecutor. So I know the correct date. So let, let's just take it. Get, give it Sherry Marshall, I appreciate the compliment. I would be a terrible so judge. I need to disconnect. Because I want to do this in my soul. Me yelling at the screen with y'all is how I want to be in court. That is not judge. That is not judicial. The amount of energy it would take for me to put all of the thoughts away so that my face does not belie them would be exhausting. I would hate it. I would, no, no, I'm much better at this, much better at this than I would be as a judge. Good as an advocate, did a good job as a, as a attorney. Michelle, or anyone else about the evidence received here in court? And we'll be back about, uh, what was that? Uh, 10, 10. Okay. The Thank fuck. All right. <laughs> and now we're at the morning break. I would, I would, the lawyers would be like, excuse me, your honor, your face. Terrible, terrible. I, I do, I do, I was made to do this. I want to just see if the judge says anything to the attorneys and then we'll talk about Mr. Bouillon leaving the case and why we have a new, uh, why we have a new defense attorney and the rest of it. The judge. Right. You may be seated, we're in recess does seem to take random breaks. Jen K said, this is Emily's sports ball. Uh, yes, I really do see myself as a sports commentator. I don't remember which of you in the chat called me a court caster, like a sports caster. We have an actual sports caster in the chat, uh, Amy Van Dyken, not only an Olympian and a badass, but also a actual real live sports caster. I feel like I just do the, the trial side of like MMA color commentary. <laughs> yeah, truly. Um, are you fucking kidding me is exactly what the judge is saying. And the judge was just like this, like, I would definitely be a TV judge. No, I would be a TV judge. If YouTube ever starts like a full, um, like H3 does their content court, but if YouTube ever started like a full, like judge Judy, but on the internet, I could, I could do that. I could do people's court stuff because I could be sassy. You can't be, can't be sassy. <laughs> Amy, you're so sweet. We, I'm a, I'm a real broadcaster. I'm going to tell Griffin. All right, let's talk about what the fuck happened with Mr. Bullion real quick. And then we will zoom, zoom past this break. But since the morning break is here, uh, that, nope. That's not what I was looking for. We're going to stretch. We're going to talk about this weird minute order that popped onto the court's website today. I have ne I have... It's a, it's a strange thing for me here. Let me switch my screen share real quick. Uh, it's a strange thing for me to see an attorney leaving like the second day of trial <laughs> and a new attorney coming in the second day of trial. Um, lawyers leaving trial midstream generally doesn't happen. So let's talk about this. This, uh, this filing is from 226 at 1245 PM. So lunch yesterday. And we heard rumblings of this. I wanted to see the court order. Um, because we heard rumblings of this, I should have swooped. What happened to Hannah Gutierrez Reed's defense attorney, Mr. Bullion? Do we no longer have bowls of bullion? That's where we're at. We've seen Mr. Bullion on the Zoom calls. We saw him the first two days of trial, but February 26th, yesterday, day three of trial at 12.45 p.m., we have this minute order from the court. This matter came before the court on defendants February 26th, verbal motion for withdrawal and substitution of counsel. Bullion asked to leave the case. Having considered oral argument and being otherwise fully advised, the court finds, concludes, and orders. Defendant's motion for withdrawal of counsel is denied. Denied counsel, you don't get to leave on like the third day of trial. Mr. Bullion shall remain co-counsel of record, attend trial, and continue to sit at counsel's table. However, to avoid potential disruptions at trial, Bullion shall refrain from directly communicating with defendant Gutierrez as requested by defendant. As requested by defendant. What? What went down between Hannah Gutierrez and Mr. Bullion? 
because I imagine uh, it didn't go well. Defendant's motion to allow entry of new counsel, Ms. Monica Barreras, is granted Ms. Barreras may enter her appearance in the case, and we saw that yesterday. Lead attorney, Mr. Bowles, shall direct and coordinate co-counsel Bullion and co-counsel Barreras' respective participation in the trial, if any. She, Hannah Gutierrez, does not want Bullion. Bullion made a motion to withdraw. Hannah could have brought a motion to fire her counsel. She did not. Bullion brought, brought a motion to withdraw, but something has gone awry between the two of them and her not being involved or him not being involved in her case is at her request. Be seated. Let's continue. That is wild stuff. I don't know what happened between them. Maybe we'll never find out because attorney client privilege, but something went down between Bullion and Hannah Gutierrez. Bullion's number, it, it could be a chat. You are correct. It could be as simple as not getting paid. It could absolutely be as simple as not getting paid. Could be, but uh, could act could actually be. But Bullion's not the one that admitted the cell phone data. That was Bowles, and Bowles's number was the one that got got uh, disclosed. Bowles and Hannah's numbers, but she wanted him removed, and he made a motion to be removed. She doesn't want to talk to him, but she didn't fire him. He made a motion to withdraw. Different than her saying, "Your Honor, I don't want my attorney." That I've seen happen in the middle of trial, uh, especially with the public defender's office. I've seen lawyer, I've seen defendants be like, Your Honor, I have a motion. I don't want my lawyer. And the judge is like, We're in the middle of trial. That's not happening. So with all of that, um, let's continue with trial. That's what happened with Mr. Bullion. Let's get back to trial from the morning break. I hope you stretch. I cut myself off with my soup. I hope you stretched right. and you're hydrating. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, can you please tell the you jurors gotta, the date that that photo was taken? Is, yes, October 10th, 2021 at 9.50 in the morning. Thank you. Elmo, please. Elmo, please. What did Elmo do to you? I'm teasing. She's talking about the overhead projector one. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, um, I'm, I'm bummed that we no longer have team bowls of bouillon. Uh, the admission granted, of no soup for you. 119 through 129. I don't believe there's an objection. No. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's 119, 129 right. through 129. He's requested, through he's requested not to speak to her. All right. Thank you. Which is uh, spicy. Um, sir, prior to your testimony, did I send you some text messages? You did. Uh, are those text messages from the extraction that you performed? Yes, ma'am. On Ms. Gutierrez's phone? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It is so distracting to me that these defense attorneys... Marked that the defense attorney has to walk. I think it's just the courtroom layout. They can't just pass post-it notes. If you can just give us uh, the date and time. But I don't uh, see where Mr. Bullion is sitting. Or incoming or outgoing, who they're going from and who they're going to. Isabella, right? Uh, sure. So both of these messages appear to be outgoing. I think we all need to take a moment. Credit where credit is due. Thanks for fucking redacting the exhibits. And we see that this is coming from the same phone. The name of the phone is at the very bottom. Just, it's there. From the, uh, what's identified as the owner of the device, Hannah Reed, to a contact named Becca Santa Fe. The first message has the timestamp at the bottom right of October 23rd, 2021, 1228 PM. And it That's says- That's why they wanted the date. This was close in time this was like a month after the shooting when the shit was hitting the fan with whether people were going to be getting um, charged or not. Hey, comma, I might be coming to Albuquerque tonight and was wondering if I can get that stuff. Uh, the next message has a timestamp of October 23rd, 2021. This is about the drugs. PM, and it says, Becca, call me when you get a chance. And states exhibit 120. I also don't think it's evidentiary valid to be like, can I get that stuff and say, obviously that means drugs. I don't think that's I sufficient I to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that stuff is the drugs, but that's what the prosecution is going to argue. Yeah. We'll zoom in and we'll just move it around a little bit. These are texts between so Hannah Gutierrez. So the first Gutierrez message is an outgoing uh, from the same content, Hannah Reed owner Becca. to Courtney Santa Fe. Uh, the message states, he gets in in 30 minutes or so. Becca hasn't texted me back at all, and I'm trying to get my things from her tomorrow. This message was sent at uh, on October 23rd, 2021, stuff. 
at 6.20 p.m. The next message is from Courtney Santa Fe to Hannah Reed, the owner of the device, and it just says OK. Uh, with the timestamp of October 23rd, 2021 at 6.24 p.m. Look at those being redacted. The next one is from Hannah Reed to Courtney Santa Fe. It says, K, no if... October, I agree with excuse you. Excuse me, let me start over. K, let me know if you hear from her at all. Thanks for checking on me again. Miss you already. And that is timestamped October 23rd. No, I don't like the drug charges either. At 6.25 p.m. We'll talk about it at the break. You guys have a lot of questions. To, um, let you know that uh, some of this uh, would ordinarily be hearsay, but they've agreed to let the... Um, let the entire um, portion in for completeness. and it's for context effect on listener. Okay. Thank for you. completeness. Um, I will talk about the, how I see the drug charges um, as we go through it. But if you haven't watched my coverage of the hearing where they argued it, I understand the hearing. I understand the judge's ruling. I think they are overreaching. I think that hurts the prosecution. We'll see what the jury thinks. States Exhibit 121. Uh, another message from Hannah Reed to Courtney Santa Fe. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, if you haven't proved it's drugs, I don't know how you charge it tampering with evidence that it's drugs. You never drug tested it. How the fuck do you know what's in it? This one, the top message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Courtney Santa Fe. And the message says, could Becca maybe drop off my things to y'all since I haven't been able to catch her? That is uh, November 13th, 2021 at 7.02 p.m. Also, after this traumatic event, whatever you think of Hannah Gutierrez Reed and how she did or didn't do her job, she was still at a workplace where a fatal shooting happened that she was responsible for safety. It's not odd to me that another member of the crew might have gotten things out of her hotel room for her, depending on what was going on, and those things might not be anything nefarious. It, it just might not be. The next message shown there is from Courtney Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. I asked is that like Danny California? Will, and that is uh, the same time or the same day, November 13th, 2021. Unless these people are going to come in and testify, which they probably will. States Exhibit 123. That they're going to come in and testify. She was asking me about cocaine. The top message is from Hannah Reed owner to Becca Santa Fe. Hey, coming to Albuquerque tomorrow. That is time stamped November. It looks like 7th, 2021 at 2.52 p.m. And the next message is from oh. Hannah Reed owner. Miguelina, thank Fe. you. Going to be there for a week or so. November 7th, 2021 at 2.52 p.m. Shiraz, I have a roadcaster. So it's the road. It's the roadcaster. I have a list The somewhere. top one is from Becca Amazon? Santa Fe. Uh, from Becca Santa Fe to Mike Hannah Reed owner. I'm in Roswell working on Barron and Toluca. And that is... Timestamped November 8th, 2021. Yeah, Becca's on another at 9 set. AM. The next message is from Hannah Reed, owner to Becca Santa Fe. Ah, oh, is that far? Bummer, I wanted to see you. And that is November 10th, 2021 at 2 39 p.m. Locals in the chat, how far is Roswell from Santa Fe? States Exhibit 125. This one is from Hannah Reed, owner to Becca Santa Fe. And it says, Hey, Becca, mind if my brother in law picks up my things from you after Thanksgiving? He lives in Albuquerque. That is timestamp November 22nd, 2021 at 5.53 p.m. States Exhibit 126. I know these are um, a little out of order. We'll, we'll pull them together with another witness in terms of their chronology. Go ahead, sir. Uh, this one is- They're a little out of order. We'll pull them together with another witness is not ever what I want to hear from the prosecution. Can you please, can you please just tell us the story so from I understand? Hannah Reed owner to Courtney Santa Fe. Hey, do you have Becca's number? And that is- October 23rd, 2021 at 5.17 p.m. States Exhibit 128. A message from Hannah Reed, owner, to Becca Santa Fe. Becca, with a question mark, on October 24th, 2021 at 11.31 a.m. Is Becca leaving her In unread? Context, 129. Um, this one, the first one, is from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed, owner. And it says, hey, dot, dot, dot. I am in Hamas working on Big Sky Splinter Unit. That is October 24th, 2021 at 11.33 a.m. The next message is from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. How are you doing, lady? And that is October 24th, 2021 at 11.34 a.m. And this is after, this is like a month Thank after you, the sir. shooting. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. So he's the foundational witness to Processing. get these in. I just, I think there's a way to tie these together, at least in order. 
but he's the foundational witness did part of the cell phone extraction he's uh verifying that these text messages are legitimate i don't know how relevant these are going to be we'll see emily said fun fact morning, jensen Frank. eccles is also a series regular in big sky so you looked at phones and i'm going to focus on uh sarah zachary and dave halls you looked at those two phones didn't you i did um and for sarah zachary and dave halls you bookmarked a uh, very limited data that you extracted right yes ma'am so you so you didn't extract all the data on sarah zachary's phone right i did full extractions on all phones that were given to me ma'am. and then you bookmarked the limited data and passed that on to detective hancock right yes ma'am that is correct and the same for dave halls you you bookmarked limited data and passed that on to detective hancock right yes ma'am but isn't it true that you don't know the significance of any of the items you bookmarked um, and what they have per to do pertaining to the shooting event, do you? Can you phrase the question differently, please? Sure, and, and you talked about this a little bit in your pretrial interview. Um, the significance of the items from the phones of Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls, um, you bookmarked those, but you don't have any information, you don't know the significance of what you bookmarked in relation to the shooting event. I don't know if I would word it as significance. I, I generally do what is requested of me within the request form. Okay, so if you don't ask, you don't get. So he's like, if the prosecution says, can you look for this? That's what he looks for. Do you remember that makes giving sense. a pretrial oh. interview in this case, um, November 29th of 2023? I do. Okay. Um, and counsel, I'm referring to page five lines 19 through 24. Okay. I really um, like the way she did that. Asked, Thank you, ma'am. Specifically with respect to the examination of Dave, Hall, Dave Hall's phones, um, so of these items from his phone, do any of them have any significance to this event, this shooting? And answering, I don't know. I just booked market for the case agent. That way she could make her determination. Right. That's correct. I didn't say that. Okay. That seems appropriate. So, so then you'd agree with me that the items that you bookmarked um, and gave and passed on um, that we're, we're talking about here today pertaining to, to Dave Halls and Sarah, um, you don't know the significance of those items pertaining to the shooting. Not his job. Well, ma'am, it is not my job to determine significance. Exactly. I just determine, or I don't even determine, I just find what is asked of me within the request form and I leave it up to the case agent and to continue her investigation with it. Not my job. Okay, and you, you also don't have any texts between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kinney before October 21st of 2021, right? I do not remember. Okay, do you remember your, your um, uh, did you review your report prior to coming into court to testify? Uh, there was multiple reports for this and unfortunately I can't commit all of them to memory. Okay, so sitting, sure. That's an odd time to ask to approach. She's, this is a very typical and normal cross-examination. I don't know what, why the judge is asking them to approach, but uh, ha half of the cross-examination of law enforcement is like, look at all this shit you didn't do. And law enforcement going, not my job, not my job. That's not my job. That's not my job. But part of the defense's argument is going to be, look, they weren't actually investigating Sarah Zachary or Dave Halls. They weren't investigating anybody else. They were just investigating Hannah and she's the scapegoat and they looked at nothing. And so they didn't do a thorough investigation. And the more criminal cases you watch, the more you'll see that the police didn't do their job as a very common and standard defense. All right, we're gonna zoom, zoom past this sidebar. God, I love being a little bit on delay. This is, I wish I could have done this in real life. <laughs> the judge's face. She is always like, what the fuck is happening here? Why does the prosecutor have so, what is happening? <sighs> Um, so, so sitting here today, um, it, it, is it fair to say you don't remember, um, any text messages in your review, uh, between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kinney? I don't. Before October 21st of 2021? I don't, ma'am. Okay. Um, and you weren't asked to examine Seth Kinney's phone, were you? I don't believe so. That was not one of the phones that was given to me. And you weren't asked to examine Alec Baldwin's phones, were you? No, ma'am, I was not. I believe yeah. Alec Baldwin said, the fuck you're getting case, my phone. Is that unusual to you that in a shooting case, not to be looking at the, the shooter's phone right away? Not not always. Okay. Um, but but regardless, the, your, the work you did in this case was limited to what Detective Hancock specifically directed you to do. Yes. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, just a moment, Your Honor. Unlike your client, Baldwin said, no, what you're not going to do is search my phone without a search warrant. Your client um one of the defense attorneys yeah. was like how about it mr french are you aware that mr baldwin submitted his phone for extraction in the state of new york yes i am thank you 
I think this witness is excused. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next witness. They're going real fast. It calls Luke Pace. Luke? Something like King. Uh, let's zoom, zoom a little bit. So again, not my job. Again, it's going to be really weird with the prosecution protecting, like feeling like they're protecting Baldwin. It's like, are you aware that Baldwin's phone was extracted in New York? Okay. I mean, you're prosecuting him over the summer. So I don't know what we're doing with any of that. All right. Thank you. Have a seat. Talking to the microphone. Uh, Sith Your Panda. Honor, to our uh, agreement with security in terms of firearm safety, uh, uh, Mr. Rice is going to provide Mr. Haig with a box that has a firearm in it. Oh, the firearm is coming into court. Um, Sith Panda said, seriously, Detective Hancock searched Pussy Pal's phone. Y yep. Clear. This case yes. turns us into a Twitch chat of 13 year olds. It's fine. I suspect Mr. Haig will clear it again. Yesterday, I think we yelled, let him cook. Um, we talked We talked about pullout game week. We, uh, he's safety checking the clear. weapon. We, uh, Sir, can and you go ahead and state your full cock. name for the record? Lucian C. Haig, spelled H-A-A-G. Oh, hello, Lucian. Can we call him? -E can we call him Lucian? How are you currently employed? I have my own consulting firm in Carefree, Arizona, Forensic Science Services. Court TV is just like the gun, the gun, the gun, the gun. There is the gun, the gun. I think it's important for the jury to see how large um, of a weapon it is. I think it's important, but look, he safety checked the weapon, and I think he's going to show that to the jury. What does Should forensic he have gloves science on? services no. do? In this case, they've already checked this gun a million times. It is often the preference to have gloves on when you're handling things, but this has already been done. So, I'm involved in firearms evidence examination, primarily the reconstructive aspects of shootings, distance determinations, uh, long range shootings. This is it a ricocheted bullet? Uh, how close was the gun when it was discharged? Those are all reconstructive issues beyond the usual identifying a bullet or cartridge as having been fired from a gun. Yay, reconstruction. That's something I also do, but my main focus is the reconstructive aspects of shootings. Awesome. What were you asked to do in this case? Well, a number of things to determine. Uh, and and, and let me let, let me stop you real quick. Were you asked to do reconstruction or were you asked to do more examination and identification? Identification was a small part of what I did. I did do that with the evidence cartridge case, but primarily reconstruction. On this in this case, that's correct. OK, um, and can you I hope uh, there's a chart. give the jurors an idea of your background and experience, please? Yes, most uh, criminalists, which is my uh, professional title, I have a degree in one of the physical sciences. Mine is in chemistry with some minor in physics. Uh, that was obtained in 1963 from the University of California at Berkeley. I then went to California State College at Long Beach, taking two more hey! years of study, which included two semesters of Go criminalistics. Beach. That course was taught by the primary firearms examiner for the city of Los Angeles. Other courses were mathematics, clinical chemistry, documents examination. That takes me to 1965 when I gained I employment with the city of Phoenix police crime never remember as an entry-level criminalist. Um, I was sent on to Arizona State University, local university, for additional coursework. I started attending meetings of professional organizations that deal with firearms evidence because that became my main focus in the crime lab. Although I worked in all sections, I later supervised them. My real interest and passion was the ballistics or firearms unit of the laboratory. I left there, there being the city of Phoenix crime lab. I get it, in, guns are fascinating. Uh, 1982, so I was there about 18 years. I'd been doing some private consulting, some teaching at that time. I was an instructor in criminalistics, which included firearms evidence. Um, I started my own company when I left the city of Phoenix. My company became my full-time employer and I've been working there ever since. The gun was broken. Sir, do you have any professional membership? So I don't think this gun will fire, yes, but it of them. can the, still be the gun. The they put it back together. There's an organization called AFTE, A -F -T -E, the Association of Firearm and Toolmark Examiners. Um, I'm a, a longtime member. I became uh, president in 1985 and we, 86, served on a number of committees. We learned a lot about tool marking the in the Murdoch Association trial. of Criminalists. That's the nearest regional area. I'm a distinguished member of that organization. I'm a member and fellow in the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which has a criminalistic section. I'm an associate member in a European organization. Um, that's most of them.
Okay. Uh, can you summarize for us your uh, presentations and I'm a professional. I do lots yes, of things. I'm very patient about presenting evidence among our, our peers in the AFTI group. So to date, I've presented, and most of them have been published, about 200 publications over the last 50 years or so. Um, I've authored I with my surprised. younger son, who you'll probably hear about, a textbook on shooting incident reconstruction, which is now in its third edition with the unimaginative title, Shooting Incident Reconstruction. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, have you received any citations or awards? A scientist with yes, a sense of humor. Yes, the AFTI group I mentioned before has voted me Key Member of the Year Award several times, Distinguished Member Status, likewise the California Association of Criminalists, and they have a fairly uncommon award called the Roger Green Award that's for historical work. And I'm very interested in history, especially cases that involve the use or misuse of firearms. So I received that award from the CAC. And. Um, have you been qualified as an expert in the there we go of firearm examination and or reconstruction he's like i literally wrote the book approximately how many times well over the last uh well, more than half a century 57 years several hundred times i'm sure uh have you been qualified in both state and federal courts yes i have um have you been qualified in numerous states in the united states about half of the states in the united states and several foreign countries what foreign countries uh, are you just Northern curious? Ireland, uh, case in Guam, um, I think, and in Canada, okay, several times. Um, sir, do you have any particular cool. interest or expertise in uh, single action revolvers or old Western style revolvers? Uh, yes, I'm interested in all types of firearms and their mechanisms. It's but my single action too. guns are, of course, what we see in in Western movies. Um, they're fairly straightforward. They're historic. Sam Colt is a well known name. Um, and he was an inventive genius, and his firearms uh, to this day are still prized as collector item if you are so lucky as to have an original. Um, and how did you become involved in this case? I think it started with a phone call in March of last year, where the, I was well aware of the case. I'd heard about it. Oh, the news. I didn't know much about it other than there had been some sort of a misadventure on a set with a death and an injury. So after that, well, documents uh, were received. That's one way where to say I it. start every case. I want to read what's known about the case, what the issues are. Uh, interviews were sent to me, um, a lot of photographs. And ultimately, uh, in July of last year, I went to the local property room with the custodian there, and along with my younger son, Mike, uh, we received, well, I think an inventory over 50 some items, but some of these had sub items in them. Yeah, so it's a was, lot of items. the beginning. Um, as a part of the document review that you did in this case, did you review uh, the ballistics report and the case notes from the FBI. Yes, I did. Okay, so we're expert. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, is there any objection to tendering Mr. I'll ask the court to uh, accept Mr. Haig as an expert in. She keeps forgetting to do it and the court keeps getting annoyed because she keeps forgetting to qualify the experts, um, which is a critical error. Uh, firearms examination and reconstruction. What is All right, no objection, yes. He's such an expert. Thank you. He is um, so much of an expert. So, yes. in, so, so in addition to reviewing All the FBI uh, examination report and the case notes, uh, you also took numerous items of evidence into your own possession and performed testing on those uh, on those items. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, was the uh, evidence revolver in this case that I'll refer to as the Baldwin revolver, was that was that one of the items that you that, that you took into your possession and tested? Yes, it was. Um, let's start with the FBI report. Let's go ahead and find it. Screen. Mr. Bowles, is Mr. Hague your witness? Is forgetting to qualify Mr. witness something that could be brought up on appeal? Uh, the court keeps fixing it. Um, it would just depend on if she's convicted. Uh, but the court keeps fixing it. It's just, I again, um, Sophie is asking in the chat, is this a new prosecutor? She's a special prosecutor, which means this is not her regular, she's not regularly employed by the prosecutor's office. Um, and she keeps forgetting to qualify her experts. So the court keeps interrupting to qualify the experts, which, you know. Uh, Emily said, do they just take his word for it or do they actually check how many times he was qualified as an expert? 
generally in their CVs, it's in there. Your Honor, I'm going to um, defense investigators. I think will for the admission of states exhibits. Will sometimes Google, but generally well-known experts are well-known. So it's uh, not a question. If an expert they've never heard of before, they're going to do a bit more. All right, states one, 130 through 146 um, are admitted and you may publish. You guys don't forget to do the YouTube things with the almost 18,000 of you in here. Thank you. Uh, sir, so we have on your screen States Exhibit 130, but but before we speak directly um, to this, can ultimately, did you form an opinion, and I know we haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to, did you form an opinion about uh, how the damage to this firearm occurred? Yes, I did. And did you also form an opinion uh, as you, to the working condition of the firearm when it was received by the FBI. I keep forgetting to move my pointer. Let's start there. Uh, what was your opinion with regard to the working condition of this firearm when it was initially received by the FBI? By various means, I could see that it was in proper working order as designed by the original uh, inventor. And tell us what you took into consideration in coming to that opinion. Well, there are several ways. One of them is on my screen. I don't know if it's on your screen or not. But it's from the FBI examiner's report, a man named Bruce Ziegler, I believe. Who Bryce, met. Bryce, yeah. But I looked at all of his photographs and notes. And he did a very thorough report. Are the four positions that the hammer can have with this gun when it's working? Well, we're going to drop the hammer damaged. down again. The top one shows the hammer fully forward and down. That's the way it would appear if you had just fired it or even dry fired it. The next picture down looks pretty much the same, but it's not. Quarter the cock. is about an eighth of an inch rearward. Uh, and now it has engaged an internal mechanism, a safety notch. So now the hammer and firing pin cannot reach a fired, a live cartridge, I'm sorry, a live cartridge. The third picture down is the loading position, also known as half cock. The previous position could be called, and it's often called quarter cock. At that half cock position, the third picture down, the cylinder, which holds six, capable of holding six cartridges, is now free to rotate. Prior to this, in the upper two pictures, it was locked and secured by a small latch that we can't see in these pictures. Final picture, and it's the most important one, the hammer is at the full cocked, ready to fire position. You can now see the firing pin in the hammer, that it's fully rearward, and it's staying there. That will be important uh, uh, later. It's cocked open. And, and if you would, um, because it, describe and for us what the firearm is that you have in front of you. Is that this exact gun? It's the brother to the evidence gun, same make, model, caliber. Uh, it's just not the not the evidence gun. The gun he has is a demonstrative gun. Well, that answers that because I thought they put the other gun back together, but I guess you won't be able to demonstrate um, if it's broken. I thought they were going to go through the other gun, but it is the brother gun apparently for demonstrative purposes. Evidence gun. Good to know. And um, would you demonstrate for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, the the different positions and also uh, He's going to show the them the hammer action and the rotation of the cylinder. Sure. Well, I checked it, but again, He's just using... so everyone feels as comfortable as they're going to be around a firearm. Hang on He's... Just a second. Probably stand in the middle. Yeah, do you want to stand? Okay. And sure. that would be great. He's... He's using it as a demonstrative gun so the jury can understand. He has shown them now once, and he's now going to do it again, that the gun is clear. <clears throat> I'm left hand dominant, so I have to explain that. The hammer is fully down. If there were a live cartridge in this gun, the firing pin would be resting right against it. So this is an unsafe carry position if it were a loaded gun. It would also be the position if I had just fired it. There would be a spent cartridge. The firing pin would be deep into the primer of that cartridge. You can also see its trigger is back. Sir, you can't say points. deep. We can't but be trusted. That's the safety position. We Very can't be trusted. We can't be trusted. The about an eighth of an inch rearward. The trigger has just popped forward. So it's got an internal spring that is resetting. Cylinder is still locked up cannot rotate. Now when I pull it to the load position, you may have seen the cylinder rotate already. It's free to rotate now. The little latch that I mentioned, which we can't see, has been pulled down by that motion. There's a loading gate here on the side that's opened. And this is where I would either remove fired cartridges or place live cartridges up to a total of six. After loading it fully, loading he explains it, I very that well. gate. And I have two choices. If I'm ready to shoot, I'm going to cock it. And if I decided what I'm going to shoot at is to be shot at, pull the trigger. Hammer falls off of a ledge, a little notch. Actually, it's more of a step on the hammer. So now we're back to where we were a moment ago. If I'm going to fire it again, pull it all the way back, 
hammer stays in position, which we saw in the photographs, which again is important because when we get to the damage that occurred with the gun, the hammer won't stay there. If I'm going to let it down, if I'm going to render this gun safe, I decide I'm not going to shoot. I do have to pull the trigger, but I get my thumb firmly on this spur. Pull the trigger, let it down. Once I get past the halfway point, I can let go of the trigger and it engages a safety notch again. So it so won't the strike steps. the primer. It's called a single action. Probably heard that term a couple of times because pulling the trigger they heard cock one more single thing so that fires the gun. They've definitely heard it, cock more than single of, action. Sorry. Yeah, after watching loading gate. Uh, in, after in the, watching the Murdoch, gun, it's so um, nice to see a to responsible um, demonstration. The primers and the heads. And that the lawyer's not the, touching the, the gun. You have in the gun. We know that there are none, but this is, we're, we're just going to play pretend. Well, I was too uh, big. I will, I'll make myself smaller next. Show me what's I was in riveted. That I was well, riveted I watching. One downrange. Here, maybe we go this way. So that I bring the camera to camera. Yeah. yeah, don't you stand in front of him. Let's go over here. Let's, so they can, they can see oh, behind okay. us. There we go. The, she used a term, an industry term, the head stamp. It's what's written on the cartridge. And in the middle of which is a primer. So if she wanted to see, or any of you wanted to see, are there fired cartridges in here? Live cartridges, all six? I just rotate the cylinder. And we go a couple of times around, see if there are any empty chambers, more fired cartridges, or live rounds. If we wanted to take them out, if they're live, you just dump them out. If they're fired, you need this ejection rod here to knock a spent cartridge out because it's expanded. So if you were to show me the rounds that you have in the gun uh, in this manner, I can only see the head stamp and primer of one cartridge at a time. That's right. In, in this view from behind the gun with the gate open. Okay. Thank you, sir. Can you take my seat? Yes. Very helpful. Very helpful, sir. So it, it, when you, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, put a jacket on the bingo card. Is there anything else you can card. think of uh, from the documents that you reviewed uh, that uh, that that went into that contributed to your opinion that the gun was in uh, proper working order when it was received at the FBI? Uh, yes, the examiner was able to fire at least twelve live cartridges for comparison purposes uh, to recover bullets and fired cartridge cases. Uh, the gun had to be in working order to do that. Had it been in the condition I later found it, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And it had to be working to fire 12 rounds. Found it it can, won't can fire when it's broken. Describe, Thanks, sir. Um, what, what was wrong with it when you took it into evidence? And I'm going to pull a, an aid up. This is going to be an exhibit that's already entered into evidence, Exhibit 97A. It had been dis partially disassembled. It was in a gun box with some ties. I'm working on it. <laughs> Hang on. Um, I'm trying, Your Honor. I will reiterate that though it annoys us at home, the amount of stress that this kind of tech in the courtroom is going to be causing this prosecutor is very high. Where's my... Uh, you, you can, you know, use it to draw lines and okay. all kinds of stuff. So it's a touch screen. It is, if, yeah. if you need some assistance. This is one of the FBI of the many FBI pictures, and you're looking at three parts of the gun. The obvious one's the hammer. How do I erase it? Okay. The hammer's pretty obvious. Here's the firing pin. And we wanted to make a circle. It's making arrows. <laughs> the arrows are so helpful, sir. He's like, I want to make a circle. I'm sure it's a different button. But it's uh, they're helpful. I'm going to answer some questions while he's trying to make a circle. Um, Boho explored this hammer, from earlier. And I'm really pressing hard. The hammer, the important part of the hammer are these notches. You can he's see really trying. here. Thanks, Daphne. There's two clear notches. Something goes in them. Well... One of them is the, the safety position. The, talk. I'm very proud the of next it. one is the load position. The one that's very difficult to see, and I almost obliterated it, is down at the bottom of my circle. That's the that's where the full cock step would be. It's not but a it's cock. Been, Sir, uh, yesterday P we were told -E it was a cock notch. It's been uh, knocked off, rolled, rounded off, and it's full of very rough tool marks. The piece that would fit into each one of those 
is the trigger. And the trigger is the black piece here, but the tip of the trigger in the industry is called the sear, S-E-A-R. You broke the tip? That's the piece that goes in those three locations. And it really sets, it rests on this step when it's in the full cock position. So that's somewhat tenuous and the pulling of the trigger causes it to slide off the hammer to fall. There's a little piece in that circle I just drew. That's the broken off sear of the trigger. So it's an incomplete trigger. And finally, the well, because the tip came here off has two names. The industry the company that makes this reproduction gun calls it the bolt, B-O-L-T. Uh, I've always called it a cylinder stop latch. It was the thing that was securing the cylinder in the safety position, uh, in the uh, full cock position, but not in a loading position. That the left side of that goes up into the notches in the cylinder for those previous positions and drops down and allows the cylinder to rotate in the load position. So looking at those both photographically and in person, I could see that the full cock step or notch on the hammer was broken away, beaten away or knocked away. Kind of hard to describe it if you don't see it under the microscope. And the sear was broken off and the stop latch, uh, the little wings, there's two pieces that protrude out. Uh, that also was broken and the gun can't work in the normal fashion if it had been that way on the movie set. And based on your document review, do you have an opinion about how uh, the the bolt, the trigger sear, and the hammer were damaged? What, what took place that caused that damage? The hammer had to be in the full cock position and one or more substantial blows, impacts to the hammer. Because it's just sitting, the, the, the sear and the trigger and the full cock notch are just sitting there engaged with each other and it's a small area. So if you give a substantial blow, one or more to the back Sir. of the hammer, it is stressing that area and it will finally, and did Sir. finally fail. And I can see under the microscope, a lot of very rough tool marks where it's just rolled over and rounded off. It's no longer a step. It's a rounded area, which cannot retain the trigger, even if it was intact. Cause he kept What's hitting it with a hammer. Of, of the circumstances of the blows you're talking about. As I understood reading the examiner's notes and report, it was an evaluation of whether this gun uh, was prone to accidental discharge by an impact to the hammer. Okay, we're gonna uh, look at a, a few other photos here. And the reason they were trying well, to find that is because that is what Baldwin out. said in his 2020 interview. Yeah. They didn't ask for it before that because it wasn't quite said that way in the police interview. So in the 2020 interview when Baldwin said it just went off, that's that's why they started doing this testing about the accidental discharge if you bump the hammer. All right, let's uh, zoom, zoom past this sidebar. Let's shift gears for just a moment. In, in based on everything that you reviewed and also the, the, the uh, examination and the firing of this gun uh, that you yourself participated in, have you seen any evidence that the full cock hammer notch was filed or modified to allow faster shooting? No. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Um, I'm showing you what has been marked as States Exhibit 134. Can you explain uh, to the jury what we're looking at here? Yes, you're looking at two triggers from a Colt reproduction single action revolver. The lower one is from probably the very pistol that's here today. It was a new Pieta. The Colt lower one's not broken. That, uh, my younger son owns. So that's the way it should look. The one above is the broken damage trigger and the tip of the sear is not even present in this picture. So that area that's missing, just so trying to get the hang of this, it's right there. Okay, um, and I'm gonna show you what's my, been marked as my States Exhibit 137. Can you tell us what again. that is? Yes, this is a view through an instrument called a stereo microscope uh, to which a camera's been attached. And you're looking at a putting back together, so to speak, like a broken teacup where I'm putting the two parts together and all that roughness you see there are manufacturing marks. Those aren't breakage marks, but just when they made the part on the one side of it, it's been machined. And under the microscope, you can see those lines. So if you look at that, you can sort of see the contour agrees. And if we put them, my son and I put them right back together, you just see a faint line. So we deliberately pulled them apart a little bit. So you can see they're two pieces, not just a crack in a piece. So just to be clear, what we're looking at here in States Exhibit 137 is the trigger with the top part of the, or part of the sear and then the 
and then the part of the sear that was broken off. Is that right? Yes, two pictures back. If you remember, there was a little piece of metal off to one side and the trigger with a piece missing. That's what you're looking at here. Those have been put back together uh, are, are brought close together under the microscope. And this is just a demonstration that the piece of the sear that broke off fits back on to, to, to the trigger sear mechanism, uh, sort of like pieces of a puzzle. Yes. Okay. But it's not ground off or rounded off. It's snapped off. It's broken off. States Exhibit 138. Can you tell us what we're looking at I don't at think here? this helps, Again, you're looking Hannah. through the microscope at the evidence it's hammer also... as I saw it. And this area, try to do this a little better. They That's where are there should be a nice spending a lot of time on it. I don't think it helps Hannah. It's just rounded off toward the I don't right. Think it the other two really hurts Hannah. load knot. Baldwin put the trigger, the gun fired. It had a live round in it. That's the focus of this trial. But we know the defense is going to be arguing quite a lot that everybody did everything wrong. So this will ultimately end up being uh, much more substantial and significant in Baldwin's trial because it uh, – distracts his story for her her negligence her recklessness in this case is putting a live round in the gun the prosecution might try to argue that the gun was she was mishandling the gun but i don't know what evidence they would base that on at this point her loading the weapon is the issue here so this is going to be much more relevant later but they're trying to show the gun was properly functioning because the defense is going to be everybody else did everything wrong um so it's not on her because that's literally their job and they truly so, are not it's interesting testimony and these quarter cock or safety notch but the circle area should we've not learned a lot like that. about There's the gun. No step there at this point point. and it's your opinion that that uh was shaved off during the aggressive testing at the fbi yes the gun didn't break until testing so if the Six gun was broken 139 i will just say if the gun was broken it's her responsibility to know that the gun is broken and not have it in the scene because the guns are her responsibility. So if the gun was broken before, it's her problem. The gun being broken and testing is something they're going to try to pin on the FBI and say, hey, we don't even really know because they broke it in testing. Can you tell us what we've got here? Counsel, may I ask, were these introduced? Were they admitted? Yes. Earlier? I believe so. Were they? I, I asked to admit... Um, Oh, 130 through 146. Okay, thank you. Okay. The court generally has a notebook where they're looking keeping at the four exhibits. Hammers or on sort the of an oblique view. Three of them, my younger son and I provided. I bought two. He took one out of the revolver you saw here today. But the one here oh. is the that, evidence hammer. That looks and much if you different. Look across at the other three, you can see that they're they're visually quite different. And again, the evidence hammer has very little left or the sear of even an unbroken trigger to rest on. So that was a Is that because the FBI banged the shit out of the gun with a mallet? Or is that something that they're gonna argue that Hannah did? I've got questions now. Are they gonna argue that she modified this gun in some way? Because everybody's saying they don't see that it's modified. I'm not quite sure where they're going. We'll see. Purpose to just to show what do these things look like and does the manufacturer make them in a reproducible way? And of course, it's her job to know. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit 135. Yes, this is the, again, company calls it the bolt. Um, I know it as the cylinder stop latch. You, as a user, would only see that part it comes up and down inside the frame of the gun to lock the cylinder up or to release it. The rest of it's well within the gun and it's being operated when you. Uh, pull the hammer back and it's broken. One of the little ears or tabs uh, is broken off. Can you hold up your um, exemplar revolver and just show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the, the, the area of that bolt that you have circled? Can you just show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the notches on the cylinder where that engages? Sure. It, you might be able to see the notches here. Nurso, it is around. a negligent homicide in New Mexico. In. It's called involuntary you manslaughter. You can't see the latch unless we disassemble the gun. If you were to have this in the jury room and you were to look through here, there's a little bit of daylight. I can see it pop up and I can hear it go into the battery, so to speak. I love that the camera operator is trying. Thank Otherwise, you, camera you operator. Not see it. You just know if it's working or not. And show me, I'm sorry, can you show me? Someone remote operates these cameras sure. in court. Let's bring it to the load position. Let's, let, let's walk around so that they can see it just a little bit better, especially since the... Sir, the you can't say load see. to us. We're not recovered. I'll just walk down the line. My finger's right at one of them. 
he's so close to the jury box um that we're gonna he's gonna be cut off he's showing that to the jury um and the camera's not gonna get any closer because he's um so close to the jury box which is fine they're the ones who need to see it I'm going to shift gears real quick because then we're going to have to move to another machine. Um, the maybe were you also asked to examine some uh, ammunition in this case? A lot of ammunition, yes. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Vicki Thomas, yes, that's what the FBI said I'm yesterday. I'll show you what's been marked as that it can State only fire when fully cocked. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? It's a disassembled 45 Colt cartridge with a type of bullet known to the shooting community as a semi wad cutter bullet. The red material is just a, a, a lubricant that can be any color. So it's not the red color that's important. It's the shape of the nose of this bullet called a semi wide cutter. And what's this? Uh, that states exhibit 132. Uh, that's a much better picture of the contents of that packet. The cartridge case is on the right. The semi wad cutter cast lead bullet. This bullet was made in a bullet mold uh, is right there. You can see the Truncated cone is the hey. $10 description of that nose shape. It was going it's to be a cone loops. that truncated at the top. Again, semi wide cutter bullets, the other name for it. And in the vial is the propellant. And that's a propellant uh, very well known to me called Trail Boss. It's designed and intended for cowboy action shooting and lead bullets in traditional firearms like this. And sir, what it's was called your understanding Trail Boss, of, sir? Of the, the sword. What would it take for us to rename it to Shoot Loops? Because we really like that. But apparently it's called Trail Boss. I, this guy's fascinating. I love him. Source of this cartridge, and, and when I say source, I mean in terms of the relevant locations in this case. This was one of a number of cartridges like this that came from a supplier in Albuquerque of uh, ammunition, okay. props, uh, dummy cartridges, so on. Do you know if that was PDQ props? Yes, that, I recognize the name. Okay, thank you. And States Exhibit 133, what's this? This is one of five live cartridges that were recovered by investigators from this scene. Uh, you can see, probably see, that the powder looks very different. It's smaller, it's darker, it doesn't have that little donut shape. Um, the bullet style is also very different. Uh, setting the blue lubricant aside, this is a round nose bullet with a truncated nose. So it would have been completely round had the bullet mold not had this flat area uh, to produce this, this flat appearance. And this is pretty much like a traditional bullet from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And again, a cartridge case, 45 Colt cartridge case is on the left. So if we have a live primer in that cartridge and put it all back together, it's a live cartridge, not a dummy. So Mr. Haig, if I went to a gun store and I bought a box of ammunition, would, let's say I'm buying 45 Colt caliber ammunition, would that box perhaps include what we're seeing in 133 and also what we're seeing in 132? From professionally made purchased ammunition, you're not going to see an M&M situation or mixed, mixed bullets. They're all going to be the same weight, style, same kind of propellant, same head stamps, and of course, the same kind of primer. They can come either nickel plated or plain uh, brass. And the live ammunition that was taken from the set of the movie Rust, um, can you describe the characteristics of that live ammunition in terms of the head stamp, Ooh, like the, uh, the primer, uh, those just sort of exterior identifying Yes, if we could go back to the other sure. exhibit with the blue bullet. I was there's looking one to of them. see if we were on uh, 1.25 and of course, we are. Because the cartridge just turned sideways, but it's a nickel plated primer. It looks like chrome, we went, shiny nickel plated. We went over this uh, with the other witnesses back loaded, quite a lot. You would only see the top, basically half mm. of the bullet. The Excuse part me. of the blue lubricant would be inside the cartridge case. And the powder, the gunpowder in the little vial would, of course, be inside that cartridge. So putting it all back together, you'd have a complete round of ammunition. The head stamp. Probably heard that term plenty of times, so I don't need to define it. For these cartridges was Starline. It's a very well-known manufacturer of cartridge brass. They do not manufacture loaded ammunition, at least not as I sit here today. So Starline's well-known. I use it myself. I'm a hand loader. Uh, that's what you would see if we turned that cartridge up so you could see it. And what color was the primer on the live ammunition? I think I said it, but I'll repeat it. Nickel plated, shiny. You would say it. Thank you. Um, and... It's okay to highlight the important Let stuff. Let me ask you. Everybody's a little. Do you know? Uh, can a little cartridges and yeah. ammunition that look exactly like this be purchased at local gun stores? In the gun stores I I go to, yes. And uh, at my request, did you obtain some and send me some pictures? Both my son and I 
bought boxes of when bought commercial ammo. 45 Colt okay. ammunition with lead round nose bullets with a flat uh, meplet is the fancy word M E P L A T. It's the flat spot on the nose. The powders weren't necessarily identical to what we see here, but they're a type of pistol powder. Um, States Exhibit 141, what's this? This is the outer box of one of those, which I believe my younger son, Mike, bought this one. Uh, HSM is a small ammunition company. Uh, you can probably read, it's meant for cowboy action shooting. It's a popular contest with the traditional single action shooters. Uh, and those cartridges have the Starline head stamp and lead uh, bullets with flat noses on them. I'm gonna get there. Let's go to States Exhibit 140. What, what's this? Well, you can see four of the cartridges and their head stamp in an oblique view. Uh, that they don't say star line, but that's their symbol. Two little asterisks with the a line. The stars going with between. the line. They have a star uh, and a line. It's very on the nose. Designation 45 Colt and nickel primers, shiny nickel Those look the same. Uh, metal. And States Exhibit 143. This further characterizes the weight. In the United States, bullets are weighed in an archaic term, frankly, called grains. 7,000 of them in a pound, uh, but 250 grain is the traditional classic weight of the Colt bullet. So this company, HSM, now tells us you can expect if you were to shoot one of these bullets and collect it and put it on a balance that weighs in grains, it's going to be around 250 grains, plus or minus a grain or two from the shooting and impact process. So the grain comes from tried, weighing the bullet. I tried right. to let hand loader go. Or the powder. And just as, as an aside, did, did you um, examine the uh, projectile from this case, the projectile that was removed from Mr. Souza? Yes. And uh, are, are you aware of whether or not that projectile was 250 grain at the time that the FBI had it and the time that you had it? Yeah. No, it had lost some weight. It started out life, in my opinion, as a 250 grain bullet, but it suffered reduction uh, from probably two sources, a heavily fouled bore, in other words, the gun barrel through which this passes, had a lot of fouling in it from a uh, black powder substitute. I was able to duplicate that phenomenon. So the bullet now, like squeezing toothpaste, gets squeezed down a little bit and it gets some rubbed off. Plus it went through two people and it struck bone. If you've seen pictures of it, or if you do it later, it's got a lot of impact damage from striking bone. So for those two reasons, it weighed about 240 grains, as I recall, 10 grains is not much. Uh, and it was now reduced in diameter to about 44 instead of 45. Um, but in your opinion, that projectile started out as it's a, a good, 45 Colt, 250 grain bullet. It's yes. a good explanation. Um, and let me go to States Exhibit 144. What's this? One of the cartridges from that box of ammunition that you saw earlier has now been removed. So you see it's nice and shiny and new I wonder if brass. he's going to and come back is, again, around not too unlike to the, the one with the blue lubricant. In it. Issues with nose, the barrel. It's truncated, so it has that flat uh, front called a meplet. I really wonder if and he's going to come back to the fouling of the barrel, and if just a closer he view, thought the barrel was not cartridges from kept clean. H S M ammunition I think that's company. Very right, important. So this cartridge has the same physical characteristics in terms of the shape of the bullet. Is that right? As, and we're comparing them to the live rounds found on set. Yes. Um, and it, they have. Both have brass casings, is that correct? Yes. I'm, I'm also 12 uh, too. They both have the Starline brass head stamp. That's right. And they both have nickel plated primers. Yes. Chad yes, they do. Bay, though, Thank you yeah. guys are, you guys are funny. <laughs> Hannah said, I didn't know guns could be so X-rated. This is, um, it's a very serious trial, but with some of these scientific witnesses, there are going to be lighter moments, but I think it's. Okay, thanks, I just need to make a note of it. Thank you, Jared, I appreciate that. Let's connect over here. Sorry, guys. Yeah, that was loud, ma'am. Um, I'm glad that they brought an evidence computer to hook up. I don't know if he did a video reconstruction. This courtroom is empty, Amanda, but that's okay because there's like 18,000 of you here watching um, and you don't have to sit in the uncomfortable uh, pews request, in court. Uh, did you meet me in August at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? August yeah. of 2023. Yes. And, and can you summarize for the ladies and gentlemen uh, of the jury uh, what the exercise was that we engaged in that day with, uh, also, I think your son was assisting us. Yes, he was. His son um, is part of his- um, I had been requested, we had been requested to reassemble company. the evidence revolver with the broken parts, mainly the hammer Why? and the uh, the trigger. Or with the, just I think just the broken hammer with the knocked off 
full cocked step to see if it even could be cocked and would retain the cocked position. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, did we take some videos? Could it be cocked? I'm sorry. Did you record some videos while we were there? Yes. Is, is, we could it be cocked? The new a is number a of cake? times after we reassembled it with Maybe. and without the cylinder in the revolver and videotaped, I think, six runs in one session and three or six in the other. We're only going to watch two. <laughs> okay. She's trying to be personable to the jury. I don't know how that's playing. We're not in the courtroom to see, but she's like, we're only going to watch okay, two. I'm going to get him started. Great. The screen. What's that? Yeah, she hasn't marked it, Your Honor. Where are we? She hasn't marked it for identification. Did you just ask defense? Did you did you just ask defense where are we in the exhibit numbers? It's literally not Mr. Bull's job to tell you. It's 147. Unless she's looking at someone else. I hope she's looking at someone else. Bear with me here. We can fast forward you. It's gonna be 147 and 147. It makes a. it easier. All right, any objection? All right, so 147, 147A is admitted. He may publish. Video. Let me turn that volume down. It's like when the substitute camera brings video or the substitute teacher brings video in. I'm happy to see video in trial. I found the video of the movie, though very sad leading up to the sh uh, shooting of Helena Hutchins, very interesting yesterday to see what was going on on set. So. Hang on. I took it down too far. So it was more than just the tip then, if you took it down too far. Ma'am, your audio is- Is there an issue with audio? It's not great. We can hear it, but it's not. You need chat. You don't have chat. Chat is back. Right, what uh, we've done uh, to put it back in operating condition. I don't think people want to be. All the parts on the revolver are original with the following exceptions. This is a new trigger and sear, same piece. It's the original hammer. It does also have a replacement bolt or cylinder catch. Otherwise, as mentioned, every pin, screw, spring, whether that's the main hammer spring or the flat spring that operates the trigger are original to the revolver. So we... CJ, this is... Wait a sec. CJ, this is after they banged it with the hammer. Agent Rod, after they banged it with the hammer. So it went from the FBI. They rebuilt it, which is why there's a few things in it that are new. They rebuilt it to show it afterwards. I don't know what evidentiary value this has for them. We'll see if they tie it around, but um, I think the reason the courtroom's empty for those of you asking is A, uh, there's not a ton of media there. It is streaming. Court TV has to make the stream available to anyone, uh, any media organization that asks for it because they're the pool camera. And um, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is not Alec Baldwin. I think when we see the Baldwin trial, there will be lots of people there. But if you look across the internet, when we watch Depp Heard together, um there were hundreds of thousands of people across multiple streams that's not the case with this trial there are you know 18 to 20,000 of you here with me today but when you look at other streams of the trial it's a few hundred people maybe a few thousand at most this this trial does not yet have the interest that some of the others do but that's okay we're law nerds we want to be here so and what we, we get to sit in comfy is, chairs just just as a recap this this is the Baldwin gun, is that right? That's correct. They're calling and it the Baldwin gun because he's the, the one hammer, that shot it. I'm sorry, the, the trigger is is a, is a new unbroken trigger, is that correct? That's also correct. And the bolt uh, that we saw in the photos that had kind of lost an ear, is that replaced? Yes. But the hammer that's in this gun is the original I don't know hammer this from this gun, is that correct? But damaged, yes. And that was the whole point. Does the, the damage, how does it affect the operation of the gun if we isolate the hammer. Um, so this is the hammer that you believe was damaged at the FBI. Yes. Because they kept whacking it with a mallet. Which the they position. Hammer it doesn't hold. It's captured at the half cock position. Again. So what did you what, what did you ask your son to do? Here's why it matters. Even with the hammer that's been damaged, the hammer is catching at the half cocked position. So the hammer, even if the hammer was damaged the way Baldwin says, this is all about Baldwin at the moment, because did Hannah load the gun or not? We haven't even heard much about that. But if he wasn't pulling the trigger, it would have caught at the safety, right? At the half cock. So they're releasing the hammer and it's catching at the safety so it doesn't go 
all the way through and smash the primer, hit the primer, whatever they call it, um, to fire the projectile. That's why this matters, but it's a long way to get round to the fact that this wasn't accidentally fired. He's the one holding the gun. I asked him to go through the normal cycle. If you produce this firearm, this is more succinct, it, Lambert, than what I just said. Stay yep. Until you pull the trigger, it will not, because that full cock step or notch has been rounded off. The perfectly brand new trigger cannot retain the full cock position. The hammer falls to what you just saw, and it falls to that half cock notch. So the good hand trigger and its sear drop into that notch, preventing the gun from firing. So that's a that's intentional. That's what. Mr. Colt intended if somehow the gun got worn and the hammer started to drop when you cocked it, it's going to get captured. And if it gets past that point, it'll be captured by the quarter cock notch. So the gun itself with the cock notches has internal safeties built into the action of the gun. From full down when the firing pin is protruding from the breech. That without yep. pulling the trigger, Can this gun the should not accidentally fire. Reach in this video. Which is my understanding why people like these guns. That this gun is a, a hardy gun. It's not going to accidentally go off because it has internal safety mechanisms for it. Yes. When I first described how this gun works for They're you, called the hammer is fully down. So it's either just fired a cartridge or this would not be a good way to carry this gun with live ammunition because that firing pin is resting right against live primer if there was a cartridge in this gun and it wouldn't take much of a blow you don't have to hit it hard just drop it from a few inches in this configuration and it'll fire to the, the cock and from here the trigger will not allow the hammer to drop because of the shape of the notch in the hammer ah. from the half cock or load condition also pulling the trigger does not drop the hammer and the cylinder is now out of alignment with the axis of the bore and then the Tell us what you mean there, and why is that important uh, in gun handling? You indicated that the cylinder yes. is now out of alignment oh, gonna... with the axis of the bore. Well, the two things you just saw was starting to bring the hammer back all the way. Went through the safety notch, cylinder still locked up. But when you get to this position, the cylinder now rotates a few degrees, more than a few, about 10 or so. If somehow you were able to fire this gun from that position that you're looking at in the screen right now, there's going to be a real disaster because the bullet can't go down the barrel. Maybe half of it might, but the other half is going to be jammed up against that area. That's really hard to do. Uh, <laughs> and you're probably going to blow the cylinder apart. You may get injured. So there again, what Mike and I were demonstrating is if you, it's called a slip off. It, if you're trying to cock the gun and you lose your grasp on it, hammer falls, the Real. safety notch captures it. This will be the now, same witness far, in the Baldwin trial. A lot of these still witnesses will be, be captured, the same. But somehow if it got past that, the safety notch, you're going to have a, damaged at the minimum or a destroyed gun and probably an injury to yourself. Andrew, yes. And in this position where the cylinder is is no longer aligned with the axis of the bore, uh, does the firing pin hit the primer every time? No, it, it can hit it just at one side and primers are designed to detonate, and it's a proper term, with basically a central hit in the primer. If you get off to one side, you'll often have a misfire, a failure to fire. And if it gets any further than that, it hits out in the head stamp area, doesn't hit the primer at all. The more that cylinder rotates out of phase. The cylinder will be caught when released, drops. And with lateral pressure, both directions, this one slipping the thumb off to the right side of the hammer, this one slipping the thumb off to the left side of the hammer, all catch on the half cock as long as the trip. Why the example of the hammer slipping? Why would we do that example? Yeah. It can it can be a misadventure with this kind of firearm. One of them I described, you're trying to cock it and you lose control of it. If you haven't pulled the trigger, what you just saw will happen. Nothing. It'll capture the hammer. The, similarly, you can cock a gun and then decide, as I demonstrated, I want to let the hammer down. I don't, you don't want it cocked. You're going to have to pull the trigger. You're going to have to coast that hammer down. Bingo. Someone finally said, let the hammer down. I have been waiting for three days. <sighs> Thank you, sir. A good thumb on this area called the spur and when it gets past the safety notch the proper thing is to let go of the trigger we're going to start saying convoy again once again all right this is august 24 2023 right. mike haig and luke haig at the santa fe sheriff's laboratory no. let's look at states exhibit 147a another video this is all 
Just tell us before we play it, what are we looking at here? This is the same evidence revolver. You're now looking at the other side and we've removed the cylinder and the cylinder pin. Uh, Massage is everything yes, still the you. same though? We've got damaged and hammer, scheduled. everything else works. Yes, uh, everything else is I'm the having same. Some I think we wanted to see neck. the stop latch working at some at one point. Okay, we'll go ahead and play this. So thank you. 2023 in the property room, the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office. And Mike, you're on to describe what we've done to the evidence gun. So it's the item one revolver, the Pieta. Original parts include all the pins, screws, grip, the original hammer. It has the original hammer spring as well as the original flat spring that operates the trigger. The trigger is a replacement trigger. So the top of the sear is a functioning original piece. And as said, uh, original hammer, it does have a replacement bolt as well. Otherwise, all parts are original. Okay, and the hammer's in a fully forward position at this stop. The normal full cock position. Hammer and falls, stops. doesn't hold, but the half cock notch captures it. Let's do it again. I'll take it all the way down. You can see the quarter cock notch also functions. Half cock functions. And then all the way to full. And you can see the stop latch finally in that view. It's this little piece right there. It went down when it got to the half cock and then came back up when it reached the full cock position because that locks the cylinder in alignment with the axis of the barrel. I'm holding on to your questions. And again, when it was in the break. full cock position uh, and it was released and it fell and was caught at half cock, that was why? That was as designed. That's what it should do. In that situation, the cylinder would have been aligned, but it, in a way it doesn't matter because it wouldn't fire. No, I'm talking about uh, when when your son pulled it into the full cock she position wants to talk and it about didn't the cock stay notch, there. Sir. Why didn't it stay oh. there? Again, the former uh, full cock notch or step has just been beaten off. It's just it's just rounded. It's no step there any longer. So it'd be the same as the edge of this witness stand. If it were round, could it do that? Slip off. Sir. Okay, I'm just going to go slowly through the video so that we can see the bolt that you were referring to. So I'm starting this uh, video at one minute, nine seconds. I could not. <laughs> There you can see the stop latch right now. It's up because <laughs> it's locking the cylinder if the cylinder were in the gun. And it's still up because we're falling from the full cock. If we'd come from the hammer Sir, down to this very position, was it beaten it off by the so FBI? Because I think that's the testimony. I think the testimony today is it was beaten off by the okay. FBI. Um, <laughs> okay. I appreciate that this jury knows that they're sitting in a manslaughter trial well, and that we are sitting on the internet and again. that's easier for Let's us all the way down because we can use humor to uh to half move half half through functions. the sadness of this case and it fails to hold but is captured at the half cock i'll apply, apply some lateral pressure to the hammer as i release it as well that was to the right this is to the left I'm sorry for all of you at work trying to suppress course, your giggles. The notches on the hammer, pulling the trigger at the safety notch or the load condition. Those do not release the hammer. Okay, I think that covers. So, Coast, so based on the experiment that we I'm did, I'm glad you have your headphones in. in August of This has become NSFW. Um, even if what camera, what are we doing? The hammer of the gun. the camera just slipped off its cock notch. I don't know what just happened. It was like. Whoop. Remember, the cameras in the courtroom are uh, mechanical, so they are, they're the same ones we saw in Deppy Heard and in Paltrow and all the other ones, so they're rotated remotely. Uh, it looked like it just slipped for a minute. That was funny. Was damaged on October 21st of 2021. Would the trigger have to be pulled for the gun to fire? Two things. Yes, the trigger would have to be depressed or pulled. That's the point of all The of hammer this. would have to be at the full cock position. And it can't be damaged because it would do what we saw here and what you just saw here would not fire the gun so hypothetically though even if it were damaged on october 20 three things he just said because she i feel like she's going to muddy the water three things she he just said for this gun to fire and kill helena hutchins it had to be in the full cock position it could not be damaged like it is because when the hammer is slipping it's getting caught on those safety notches which is what I'm going to call them to try to explain what he just said so we can all process together. And the trigger had to be pulled. Those three things had to happen for 
this weapon to fire to cause the fatality. I don't know what hypothetical she's going to give, but he said if it was in this damaged condition, the hammer could not fire. So the gun would not have fired. And you have uh, 12 rounds fired at the FBI before they started beating off the cock notch with the hammer. First, the operator, that being Mr. Baldwin, would have had to have pulled the trigger. If he, yes, if you could get the hammer to stay at the full cock position, <laughs> that's, that's the, the difficulty to overcome. Which it doesn't want to do. It will not do. Okay. Um, and did you have an opportunity to examine the uh, spent casing uh, from from the, the rest of the set in this case? Yes, I did. Truly? Uh, did you make any conclusions about whether or not that spent casing was fired from this gun? I'm truly more interested when he was talking about the condition of the barrel, more interested to hear about the condition of the barrel because it's much more applicable to whether Hannah Gutierrez Reed was cleaning these guns or not and doing her job. I really want to I really want to know more about the condition of the barrel and the damage to the spent casing because of the condition of the barrel. The Baldwin stuff is not Yes, I did. What What's it that? is. I'm in agreement with the FBI examiner. I was able to match it under the microscope. There are tool marks on the breech face of the gun that print themselves, literally stamp themselves into the primer. And yet there were a number of test fired cartridges that the Bureau prepared, that I prepared, and under a specialized microscope for this purpose, I could see a very nice identification. So in my view, the fired cartridge was fired in this gun. And then I went on to look at the shape, location, not and even depth in of the question, firing really, impression though. is the next important question. Like not and even really in question. About that. Uh, the, the, everything that you learned from the firing pin impression and what that tells you about the position that the hammer of the gun was in. Nobody's really expired. fighting. Well, Baldwin will fight, but nobody in this trial is fighting. The cylinder was locked up and aligned. So the hammer had been pulled all the way rearward. If it did not, it wouldn't be in alignment from what I've shown you. Secondly, the depth of the firing pin impression told me from doing test fires, multiple test fires and measuring all the 12 that the FBI lab conducted, that it was a cartridge that was fired from a full hammer fall not from an effort to let the hammer down and a, slip off um, a full hammer or any fall. other misadventure, but rather a normal hammer fall from the full cock position. One final demonstration for us, if you would take your revolver out and come in front of the, the jurors. And you can stand right here so that you can speak into the microphone. So just for completeness, I would like for you to demonstrate uh, to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury using this exemplar revolver, um, the position that the, what had to have happened on October 21st in your opinion for this gun to fire? Let's show them rather than give them a verbal description. It had to have a normally function undamaged hammer. The handler, in this case, Mr. Baldwin, had to get it to this position. If he let go of the hammer, it would stay as you see it here. Pulling the trigger will fire. Now you can do that. He's very mindful. Or you can wait. Minutes, hours. But when I do that, there's a live round in there. It's going to fire. I like this. Right, expert impression is going to have the full depth from this. If and I've done it. If somehow I did this, I'm trying to let it down. So I let it slip. It either won't fire at all, or it makes a much shallower firing pin impression. I did that multiple times with the evidence gun and with the exemplars. I own several of these. My son owns several. Of them. So I can distinguish by the depth and the centering. This was a normal hammer fall from the full cock position. So had the gun fired. Let him go back to his seat. position le less than full cock, lower than full cock, in between full and a half or half and a quarter, you would be able to tell that by the depth of the firing pin impression. Is that correct? If it, what I call the slip off. If you're trying to let the hammer down and you get about the halfway point and it slips, you also have to pull the trigger, by the way, uh, it'll be a much shallower firing pin impression. It doesn't hit the strike. It doesn't strike as hard. And from the quarter cock, if you're trying to put it in safety position and you lose control of it, again, you have to pull the trigger. It just makes an indentation in the primer. But doesn't, doesn't fire. fire. Um, thank you, sir. If you can take your seat. Yeah, I know. He's uh, he's not waving a gun around the courtroom that made us all kind of go <gasps> during the... It was very uncomfortable sometimes watching it happening sir, in South Carolina. If, he was pointing it the, down, the, what we showing the, the jury to the in, side. In the documents and information that you Great reviewed, testimony. did you have an opportunity to review well presented. some videos of Mr. Baldwin on set in the church <gasps> pulling the gun out of oh. his holster? Yes, I, do. I would love to hear and his commentary on that with that type of holster. Yes. Are you, um, are we going to see the videos again? Familiar with this type of gun? 
I'm sorry. Are you familiar with this type of gun? I oh, think you've indicated you are. I yes, I've established think I six or seven of them. Okay. Um, is there anything particularly difficult or dangerous about pulling this style revolver out of that style holster, in your opinion? Not so long as you don't load it, or if you do load it, that you don't cock it and pull the trigger. Otherwise, it's safe. It's don't cock an easy it. movement to make. Um, I have no problem with how to do that. When you say it's an easy movement to make, can you think of anything you know that the gun might get caught on, or uh, or or anything that that could create danger? Not realistically. Again, the hammer secures itself well to be drug across clothing, uh, and if it fell without a trigger pull, um, and the trigger is well shielded with a trigger guard, but if somehow the hammer got pulled off the full cock position, you've already seen what's going to happen. It gets captured at the half cock position. All right. Thank you. I'll pass the witness, Mr. Bow. I'll have you I was hoping us. we would see the video again. He's approaching before cross. All right, Mr. Bowles, we're going to zoom, zoom. God, this is so much better being able to zoom, zoom. Evidence received here in court um, for lunch break. Please oh. don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, we'll be back at um, council. What time do you think? Council. Yes, Your Honor, I apologize. It's 1138. You want a quarter of? Yeah. Sure. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. So uh, quarter of one. Quarter of one. Do I have that right? <laughs> yes, you have that right. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Um, and since you're a witness, don't talk to other witnesses. I understand. Yeah. All right. All right. So we will go to lunch. We will be back here at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm going to do a quick summary after they walk out of court, and we will do q and A. Um, I'm going to just wait to see if the court puts anything on the record after the jury leaves, like we always do, but um, we will see what happens. So, and then we'll, we'll talk through everything going on in court today. Hopefully they just, hopefully they just go. <laughs> and that is, that is where we're at. All right. Let me zoom, zoom. So we're caught up to live. I'm going to shift my, um, my setup around just a little bit so I can see the law nerds a little bit better and then we will um we'll do a quick summary we'll do a q a and we will go to lunch i did mention that we are like a hundred subscribers away from a 745 745 000 subs so if you would like to make the uh if you would like to make that happen the thing will bing but i would appreciate it i appreciate you and um we're almost we're almost there and then maybe in the afternoon we'll if we hit it, we'll give some memberships. What do you think? I feel like I feel like that's the right thing to do if we hit 745 is just to give some memberships. So let us um let us go to a summary. Let us go to QA. I'm holding on to a lot of questions. You guys have had a ton of great questions today. So we're gonna do that. Oh, wait, I moved this to the wrong window. Emily, put it back. Oh, streaming. I moved, I moved my setup around and then wasn't happy with it because ADHD, shocking. All right, let's do a quick summary, shall we? Are you ready? We're ready, I'm ready, all right. I should have played the stretch music. <laughs> this morning in the fourth day of the State versus Hannah Gutierrez read, she was the armorer on the set of Rust where Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Today, the first witness um, was the medical examiner, though it is a slightly different title in New Mexico, who went through what caused the death of Helena Hutchins, which was determined to be gunshot wound. She also determined that the manner of death was accident and gave a definition for why. I was surprised by that this morning. Generally, when you have a gunshot wound or a fatal shooting where the gun does not accidentally go off, but somebody pulls the trigger, that manner of death from most coroners would be a homicide. She acknowledged that a lot of quarter, coroners would probably consider this a homicide, but based on her definition of manner of death as a homicide, this did not fit. She believed that this was best qualified as an accident. I was surprised by that, but that was her determination as a medical examiner, so it was ruled an accident. The medical examiner's determination of the manner of death doesn't really impact 
the prosecution's decision to go forward on this case. This is an involuntary manslaughter. So it's not completely inconsistent. Involuntary manslaughter is an accident that is being charged criminally because somebody was reckless in the thing they were doing. Involuntary manslaughter allows for a legal action, a lawful action done recklessly to be charged, and that's what we're seeing here. We also got into a weapons expert who brought in a, not a replica, he called it a brother gun of the gun that was used on set to demonstrate to the jury the different positions with the hammer of the gun, how it would fire, and said that this weapon on set could not have fired unless the hammer on the gun was all the way back and the trigger was pulled. That was his expert testimony. We also heard from briefly somebody who did a cell phone extraction with text messages back and forth between Hannah and Becca, the relevance of which we don't know yet. It was not explained. It was foundational information. I wonder if we will see percipient or eyewitnesses in the afternoon like we did yesterday. So with all of that, we're going to get to your questions and then we're going to get to lunch. Lonards, you had tons and tons of great questions today, and I'm going to get through as many as I can. Um, Ari said, trials make me feel thankful. My worst moments are not on camera. I mean, yes. Thank you for your empathetic coverage. Uh, be excellent to each other. A, I love the Bill and Ted's reference. I have, I have empathy for those involved in this case. No one wanted this to happen, right? It's different than a case like Brooks, where he got into a vehicle and uh, mowed people down on a parade route in a car. It's a different type of a case than that. It is truly um, an accident. I don't think anyone intended to put a live bullet in the gun. I don't think we've seen any evidence of that, but people were reckless. Lots and lots of people were reckless and their recklessness and their negligence in doing their job cost someone their life cost a kid their mom, cost this film crew their cinematographer who they were friends with. And at what point is recklessness held to criminal responsibility beyond just civil responsibility? And we heard it from the witness Ross yesterday. He was testifying because he wants justice for his friend, Helena Hutchins. And Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, was she reckless? That's what the prosecution's trying to prove. Does that mean that Baldwin wasn't reckless? No. Does that mean that others weren't reckless? No. Multiple people will be charged for this death, and we've seen that. Dave Halls was charged and pled, and Alec Baldwin has been charged and will go to trial this summer. And the production company Baldwin and a ton of others are all being sued. The amount of civil lawsuits is kind of staggering. So there's a lot of people being held responsible in different ways for this, but this set was dangerous. And it was brought up by Hannah and by others that they said this set was dangerous. This criminal case is going to come down to at the end of the day, did she put the bullets in the gun? And if she, with her training and her job, if she had checked each of those rounds, would she have caught the error? And if she had checked each of those rounds and would have caught the error, then she did her job recklessly. And then you have the recklessness needed for involuntary homicide. Last week's podcast, I break down all of the elements of involuntary homicide. So it's that's what it's going to come down to. The defense is really focusing on what everyone else did um, and, and whether or not she could operate on the film set like this to try to negate that recklessness or at least raise doubt for the jury. Like, could she have done her job? Could she have done her job in a non-negligent way, given what everybody else is doing? That's what the defense is trying to get to. I just need the prosecution to be clear. Um, but we saw it yesterday in Ross's testimony. Ross did not have great things to say about Dave Halls, um, did not have great things to say about whoever his last name Pickle is, had concerns about the safety of this set from others, and it seemed took the job because of Helena. I wish somebody would have asked the question though yesterday. Like, did you know Dave Halls to be unsafe? Yes. Did you have questions about this person? Yes. Did you have concerns about Hannah Hannah's job performance? Yes. Sir, why did you take this job? 
Did you know all these things when you took this job? Why didn't you walk off when the other camera crew left? I wish somebody would have asked. So Candy is Awesome said, is there such a thing as accidental homicide? We're here. Um, it's not in the same realm as a lot of the homicide statutes. It is a um, involuntary manslaughter. Not every jurisdiction charges this. Uh, not every jurisdiction allows for involuntary manslaughter. It is not done in every single state. In some states, this would not and could not have been charged. How does one get charged if ruled accidental? Crystal win. what the Emmy decides is the manner of death has no bearing on what law enforcement decides in their investigation or what the prosecution charges. It just needs to be explained. Courtney Slay, amazing. Thank you. Ice Ice Baby, good to see you. Being a part of the replay crew yesterday was a lonely and infuriating experience. Watching all of the emotion of you and the others was tough. It hurt my heart. It was an emo it was emotional testimony. I absolutely felt Ross's testimony yesterday. It may I I I feel for him. Um it it really did. I feel for him. And that's what if you felt for that witness, I think there was a predisposition to dislike the cross-examination. But if you're like, why is this witness here? He's doing too much. I think that was partly the prosecution's error in trying to make him an expert that wasn't an expert and the judge let her do it. And I didn't like any of that at all. But I liked that witness. His emotion was very genuine. His experience was, of course, very genuine. So the cross came by as a little, uh, for me, aggressive. And then he tried to change it, but you can't you can't undo the aggressiveness. You you can go from from kind of lukewarm to hot, but you can't go hot back the other way with a witness. The witness isn't going to have it, and that's where we saw him just like snapping back. Charlie Wilson said, 3.30 a.m. in Australia, listening along whilst trying to work on my contract law assignment. ADHD is kicking my butt today. It does that. Sometimes sleep helps. Kara, your commentary is the best part of my day. Thank you so much. Um, what is the difference between negligent homicide and manslaughter? Valkyrie, different jurisdictions. This jurisdiction, it's an involuntary manslaughter charge. Happy and yay, one year anniversary. And so th I should have closed that loop. Things get called, laws are called different things in different jurisdictions. So you're not going to see a jurisdiction, I would imagine, that would have a negligent homicide statute and an involuntary manslaughter statute because they're both the same thing. They're They're a death that was caused based on someone's negligence and or recklessness not with not with volitionalness to kill someone then that bumps into the like first second degree murder statutes happy Anne said yay one year anniversary just lost my mom i'm sorry for that thank you for helping me keep my mind off it love watching gavel to gavel with you <laughs> you add so much thank you i love doing gavel to gavel with you too thank you for the gift of membership yesterday lots of love from sweden you are welcome Lapis symbolizes truth and using one's voice. Good to know. It did look like the, the witness was wearing lapis. I saw lots of you, um, the, the medical examiner, I saw lots of you comment on that in the chat. Um, Trixie said, I've missed trial days with you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Would something like a child playing with a weapon and discharging slash killing someone still be considered homicidal or accidental? Emily outdoors, it's going to depend on the jurisdiction and the circumstances but it's death at the hands of another but they're also going to consider age of a child when the emmy makes that ruling it was unto me that this medical examiner was so focused on the intent given that they had like a day of police reports but it is what it is it's odd to me um tagged you on x new cup is pawnard approved we love the pawnards emily said first live trial welcome we've got a couple uh, a couple on the horizon this year um get in the car said you never lived in a country or in a county with three deputies a coroner who's elected deals with more accidental discharge deaths and accidental shootings it's the law of the west and the south um the coroner in la was also elected but i definitely didn't work or live in a small jurisdiction that's for sure she said incident is not always she said intent is not always present in homicide, but because the report she received better labeled it as accidental, still strange. It was odd to me too, but that's her expert opinion. And I don't, I honestly don't think, I think the Emmy's decision was odd for me, but I also don't think it matters. There's no question that Helena Hutchins was killed. There's no question that nobody intended to put a live round. The whole point of the trial is negligence. So was Hannah reckless in doing her job? That's really the question here. And I don't think that changes because the ME said, I don't see anyone intending to kill here because the whole trial is 
I don't see anyone intending to kill here. So I don't think it matters. I was just surprised. Tinkerbell says, thank you for reminding me that life could be worse. Been having the worst time in my life since 2016. Tinkerbell, I'm sorry. Keep going. It gets better. It does, and it can get better. Question, does the ruling by the ME affect Baldwin's trial? No. Same ruling, same thing. Julie said EMS would have intubated on the scene, I would think. It's which level of EMS did it, and I guess we'll see. Stacy said second tumbler ordered. Congratulations. Could we see Hannah Sue production at some point? Hannah sued Seth Kinney and Sarah Zachary. That was dropped. I don't think she has any lawsuits against production. Uh, I don't think she has any lawsuits against production, but we'll look. There's a lot of lawsuits in this, like a lot. And a lot of the recipient witnesses that are going to testify have lawsuits. Um, Stacy said, first, my daughter steals my purple lawn sweatshirt. Now she stole my brand new awesome tumbler. Must order another. And then you did. So thank you. And cheers, uh, cheers to you and your daughter for being lawnards. I know it's not picking. There we go. For being lawnards. Um, I, first, I love your interjections. I call them pew pews. We do. It's ADHD. We move at the speed. Our interruptions move at the speed of ADHD. Um, late to the game today because of paralegal duties. Hope I didn't miss much. Janice, no, not really. Live bullets on a movie set. Who put them there? Tom, we still don't know yet. The prosecution seems to be insinuating that Hannah brought them on to set, but they were different gunpowder than the ones at the prop house. They didn't search everything at the prop house, though. So we will see. Um, loving the thumbs up and super chats. Well, thank you. Question, did you ever have to take on a case on the first day of trial? Yes, but I was not a defense attorney. <laughs> So um, it's a little bit different, but yes, I have. I definitely had cases where it was like, um, yeah, we're going to need you to cover this. There, uh, There's a veneer waiting. We need you to go to jury selection. Now, I had a supervisor assign me a case while I was in the closing argument of another case, and I finished my closing argument, grabbed the file, went to a different courtroom, and the judge was like, "Miss Baker, it's nice to finally see you. I'm like, I didn't know I had a trial today, Your Honor, because I, um, I was in trial. I was doing closing argument upstairs. So if the jury calls, I have to go back upstairs. He's like, mm. it happens uh, in a prosecutor's office. Adina said, Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. I mean, I guess it happens in a busy prosecutor's office. It depends how many cases you have. Watching 1.5 with court at 1.25 by ADHD. Love speed, that speed. Tiffany, recover well. Just returned back, EDB. Missed her, others weren't as fun. Oh, um, well, I mean, yes. Emily, can you please explain why the FBI was involved for the case? Did the crime cross state lines? I think they needed the assistance in some of the forensic testing and the uh, testing of the weapon. I would imagine they just didn't have that um, that level or that capacity. So the FBI lab and their forensic labs will get tagged in on stuff that's not state lines. The FBI is not investigating the case, but their lab is supporting the case, and I imagine that was needed here um gab said off topic emily i saw you on the scandal doc what's scandal doc on hulu with impact i've seen the i know i'm in the housewife and the hustler part two i didn't know there was a scandal doc is hannah a certified armor or official training no idea nobody's covered it i don't know i have no idea what training she's required to have for her job nobody's covered it I didn't realize I was 12 until this trial. We're all, we all have a little bit of a 12 year old humor in us. And those that don't um, are probably appalled and left. So it's fine. Abby said, I don't like the 24 year old weak woman angle. She knew what the job was. She took it anyways. Her admitting she wasn't qualified makes her look worse to me. And Abby, I think that's a really, really fair point. And I'm trying to balance being empathetic and then balancing, well, you took this job and, um, you took this job. I imagine other armorers said no. Like, no. They told they said there are 17 days of weapons on set and you have eight days to be the armorer. I think most people said, yeah, no, if there's 17 days of weapons, then we need 17 days of armor. So we'll see. Um, Brandy Rose said, thankful for this community today. Me too. Just got news of a family friend who I've known um, as long as I've been alive, lost her battle with cancer. I'm so sorry, Brandy. Uh, it's a it's a tough call to get that, and one that nobody wants. Thank you, EDB and the Lawnards, for the much needed distraction. Brandy, I hope that us just saying cock all day um, is the much needed distraction. You know, what I didn't think um, 
we would get today with the weapons expert was more of what we got yesterday, but we did. Question, Emily, did you ever tell a judge that you were wrong when they fuss at you about something that was not your fault? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Because at the end of the day, when you're the prosecutor, I need a better phrase for at the end of the day. When you're the prosecutor, a lot of times, even if it's not directly your fault, it's your fault. So, um, oh yes, oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> if it's the witness's fault, it's still my fault. If it's law enforcement's fault, it's still my fault because I'm the DA. You don't always appreciate all of that going into the job. You learn quickly. Late, but objection, Guam is not a foreign country. Nicholas, I was thinking the same thing. Fair enough. Um, a friend on my college water polo team was from Guam. Beldy said, respectfully, the ME doesn't need to establish intent. She shouldn't get to establish a lack of intent either. That's a very, very fair point. A very, very fair point. Karen said, why in the world would they have authorized the FBI tech guy to whack the original gun with a hammer? That was the FBI's standard operating procedure for accidental discharge testing. And law enforcement went, go for it. So that's where we're at. Yaya Freemash said, gifted 10 memberships. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so you were ultimately responsible because you took the role. <laughs> yes, Ems. Yes, I was. Absolutely. Emily, question, is that defense attorney wanted to leave because he didn't get paid from Hannah? I don't think a new defense attorney would be on the case that fast. I have questions. I want to know. I want to know too. And that's an excellent point. She hired a new defense attorney. I don't know. Um, whacking, beating, same, same. I mean, they definitely beat, they whacked the gun with a hammer and beat off the cock notch. That's what we learned today. Those were all words witnesses said. That's not even me. Those were all words witnesses said. Um, so all words witnesses said. I'm glad uh, we have the gun, but I'm missing the razzle dazzle. S same. This all, all, all court just reminds me of Chicago. Question, why did a special prosecutor get appointed? Was there a conflict of interest? Katie H, great question. I covered this, God, like two years ago. The prosecutor's office just didn't have, it sounded like enough personnel to focus on this case. Uh, it's a high profile case. The prosecutor's office has been very focused on Baldwin. Even in this trial, very focused on Baldwin and they needed a special prosecutor. So I think they got like $600,000 so that they could bring in a special prosecutor for this. So she is not regularly employed by the DA's office, but was brought in to do this trial. Well, she's the second special prosecutor. The first special prosecutor, Baldwin's attorneys made a bunch of objections and they opted to step down. Question, if you've seen council tables this big, I don't have a perception for actually how big they are because the courtroom looks fairly small to me and it looks like they're only seating three people across. Some courtrooms have much larger council tables, some don't. Um, this is like Creighton going through each check. Yes. Motion to make a meme page in the Lawnard app for us to drop our cock memes. <laughs> I'll consider it. So, spending my birthday in court with EDB and the Lawnards, Bonnie R. Thank you so much. What happened to the defense lawyer? I covered it during the break. He made a oral motion to the court to withdraw from the case. The court said, no, he's supposed to still be sitting at council table, but he's not allowed to talk to the defendant. Crime Salvo said, can Lucian also be a witness in the Baldwin case? Yes, a lot of these witnesses, we will see them again in the Baldwin case, like a lot of them. This is part one of the Baldwin case. I'm sure Baldwin's lawyers are watching everything about this case. This is part one of the Baldwin case. So yes, a lot of these witnesses will testify. CMS, thank you for the gifted memberships. Um, V rain said AB was likely trying to release the hammer. So he did pull the trigger with thumb on the hammer and must've slipped the hammer. I, I don't know what he was trying to do. We will see. Cause he said he never pulled the trigger and they're saying that's impossible. Um, Stephanie Cocker says, doesn't cold gun mean there's no ammo, not even blanks in the gun. Yes. Seems like no one was expecting the gun to fire, not even blanks. Yes. Am I wrong? No. Thank you for your coverage. Um, no, it cold gun should have meant that, but nobody checked it. Um, shout out please to Ponard Roddy Pie Caesar. Roddy P. Caesar. I hope that's correct. Art by Julie E. Um, so let's see. 
Um, on replay, just got to the cock discussion uh, every day. I think we got a court innuendo bingo going. I think we had at least one today. I think we bingoed it beat off. I'm pretty sure that's where we, I'm pretty sure that's where we ended up. Little White Lie said, does the jury need to be unanimous? Yes, in a criminal case, they do. Daisy Girl EDB, I need to know that exact lip color. I am wearing Lawless in Velvet. It's almost gone. Um, that is the gloss, but I also have a Gerard Cosmetics lip liner under it. I just don't know. I've used this one a lot, and I don't know what color this one is, um, unfortunately. But it is a lip liner close to the color of my natural lips. Um, so that. Kate O'Brien said, I think potential accidental discharge hurts Hannah in the big picture. It removes the but for argument of Alec Baldwin pulling the trigger. I get that legally it may not matter, but the narrative. Kate, I think it's a really fair and well-taken point. Absolutely. And that's why I love having discussion with the law nerds. Will Hannah have witnesses for her to testify? Yes. The defense has a pretty extensive witness list. Did we go over her attorney's withdrawal document from yesterday? We did at the break earlier. It'll be timestamped below. Um, me, uh, Melanie, I'm my brain absolutely just buffered. I apologize. Melanie, did they not document the gun photo and video prior to testing it to oblivion? They did. And we went through that yesterday. I don't think I'd be it'd be a problem because I assume they have footage of how it functioned when they received it. They went through that, all of that yesterday with the FBI and they were able to file fire 12 test rounds with the gun from initial media reports that I would speculate came from the defense. The initial media reports made it sound as if the FBI went to fire one round and the whole gun shattered apart. That's not what happened. They fired 12 test rounds. They did all of the doc. They did all the documenting. They took care of it. Then later after Baldwin's ABC 2020 interview, they said, Oh, can you accidental discharge test this gun? And they went, bring the hammer. And then they took a mallet to the thing a bunch of times and broke it. So that, um, let's see, Emily, uh, the trial against Hannah, why is that trial against Hannah happening before Baldwin's scheduling? The charges against Baldwin were dismissed and then they did additional testing and then they were rebrought. So for a long period of time, while this was moving to trial, Baldwin didn't have charges because they dropped the charges against him. Steph sells stuff by the seashore. Why aren't they trying Alec first to make sure he didn't load the gun? Based on all the evidence they have, they know that Hannah loaded the gun and Baldwin wasn't charged as this was going towards trial. So, excuse me, Baldwin will testify this or not testify. Now I have the hiccups. Baldwin will go to trial this summer. Stacy, congratulations. Does this Emmy's opinion help Baldwin's case? I don't think so. It is, it is what it is. Um, is there evidence Hannah, because again, with Baldwin's case, they're not going to argue that he intended to kill Helena Hutchins. They're going to argue that he's reckless in doing his job, both as an actor and as a producer. So the actor angle, I suspect, will be he pointed a gun at a person, pulled the hammer and uh, cocked the hammer and pulled the trigger while pointing it at a person who was like a foot and a half away from him. And that is negligent handling of a firearm. That's the first angle. The second angle will be as a producer, the safe was on set. He did his job so recklessly that the safe was the set was unsafe and therefore even though he was lawfully doing his job as an actor or producer he did it so recklessly it caused his death i think those are the two angles we're gonna see that is exactly why you load one round skip one hole load four rounds this allows a user to carry the gun safely on the empty hole making it drop safe bad splinter an excellent excellent point um, Erica said, I don't understand why the prosecution going into evidence that Hannah has no involvement in. Shouldn't they stick to witnesses that show Hannah loaded it and B and two didn't do the job properly? I think they are trying to cut off the defense arguments before they happen instead of doing them on rebuttal. So they are looking at, oh, the defense is going to argue this. This is the evidence that does it. I think they're trying to do it that way. We'll see. Medicated moment said, if you whack it too hard, you're not going to be able to cock successfully. Everybody knows that. It's a very fair point. Um, Little Nelski says, caught up to live, need intense Bravo research. Okay. Um, let's see. Moon, Magic Mayhem, Jen said, my mom unfortunately caused an involuntary manslaughter when a drunk man jumped in front of her car. It broke my mom's heart, but the cops said the man truly was out of his mind and likely intended to die. Um shouldn't be charged that sounds 
I would be su surprised if your mom was charged for that because there are, I've had lots of accidental cases where nobody was charged because they weren't doing anything wrong. And if you're just driving, you're not doing anything wrong. If you're like in a sidewalk or something, or no, not a sidewalk, in a crosswalk or something, then you are. But I would be surprised if that was charged, if somebody jumps in front of your uh, vehicle, unless you're like going a reckless speed or there has to be some element of recklessness. Um, but there are people who have caused accidental deaths, car collisions, um, and things like that who feel horrible, but it, it, they didn't do anything wrong. The thing just, things do just happen with nobody being reckless that cause people to die. And that's, there's a guilt to that, um, when you accidentally cause a death. Uh, my idea said, is there evidence Hannah Gutierrez actually loaded the gun or just ex uh, expectation? No, she told Dave Hall she loaded it. Just because it's her job doesn't mean one someone else didn't do it without her knowing, maybe the prop head or Baldwin or Hall since he brought the ammo. Um, I don't know if Hall brought the ammo. I'm not clear on, I don't think that we've seen that. Um, but she told Halls that she loaded it and she told police that she loaded it. We're going to see her police interview that's going to clear a lot of this up um it's fair does productions negligent negate hannah's no it doesn't civilly it can be apportioned if hannah's sued civilly it's like who's more culpable and in civil you do those scales of who's more culpable like you owe more money because you fucked up more and you were in a bigger position of power but that's a civil determination and criminal no what production did doesn't negate what hannah does but i think what the argument from defense will be is that because production was so bad she wasn't reckless in doing her job they set her up to fail i don't know if that's going to fly because at the end of, it's her job it's tj talk said question isn't it possible the hammer had previous wear but still would catch the sear but after the whacking by the fbi lost the ability to catch absolutely possible the fbi is the one who damaged the ability for it to catch mf said do you think the state collected bullets from the yellowstone filming for comparison no do you think parts of jensen's interview will be shown also no uh, unless Jensen testifies, but no, I don't think they're not going to show his interview if he doesn't testify. All right. Uh, boop the snoot said, is it required for the armor to have full knowledge of the weapons to determine if the weapon is faulty? I would suspect yes, but we haven't had any expert witnesses in what the armor is supposed to do or not supposed to do yet. Glad I'm finally catching alive. Um, I don't, the trial is on finally on verdict watch. I didn't follow that trial. I don't really like this judge. She is just permanently busy. Doesn't have a personality with the jury. She definitely isn't. Uh, she's very kind of straightforward. Um, she She's not Judge Newman. She's very straightforward. I don't dislike her. She's very straightforward. Blessed in Texas said question, was the seer broke already before Alec fired or broke by the FBI's guy hammering? The FBI guy. Do we know the answer? Yes, the FBI guy. Um, because the FBI guy successfully test fired like 12 times. So FBI guy. Uh, so we do know that. Let's see. Jen Jen Nap. I would love a nap. Do you think Hannah's stoic demeanor will hurt her in the eyes of the jury? Not necessarily. It's going to depend on the jury and their own life experiences. But she is supposed to present as a professional armorer. And we heard testimony that she wasn't professionally doing her job. I think her... Perf or her um, I think her her demeanor in court has been appropriate. I think it's been appropriate. So no, I don't think that will hurt her. I think it's been appropriate. Um, let's see. Can you use your YouTube connections and tell them there's an autocorrect error in super chats? So hard to type these. I can, Amy. Um, if you could email us a little more details, I can pass it on, but I can have them look into it. Luke reminds me of Richard Marks from the Depp Heard trial with the career history and knowledge, and they both have great names. Lush, Lucian. Question, can she be subpoenaed in the Alec Baldwin case? L. Teddy 13, I don't know which she is. All of the witnesses testifying here can potentially be witnesses in the Baldwin case. Hannah Gutierrez being a potential witness in the Baldwin case is going to um, is going to depend on the outcome of this case. Uh, OBG said, why call it the Baldwin revolver? Doesn't that take the focus off the defendant? I mean, this prosecution team is pretty focused on Baldwin. But it's for clarity instead of calling it you know evidence item number 31 it's the baldwin gun um whitney thank you the streams make my neuro spicy self happy me too emily can you please explain why the fbi was oh we did that one um 
Miss Megs 31, Runkle discussed last night. RA figured it out. Bullion was responsible for the court's anger about court TV on day two. But what else happened? I mean, uh, uh, attorneys attorneys getting in trouble with the court is not weird. Um, but I'll, I, I think Recovery Addict has friends in court, so I'll definitely ask. Emily, what brand of glasses are you wearing? I think these are Dolce & Gabbana. They're from, either way, they're from Lens Crafters. I got my tumbler and now needs spare straws. <laughs> the straws bay. Fantastic. Um, one grain equals four weak grains. Seriously, teeny amount. It's a weird measurement, but I guess it works. <laughs> Don't forget about the full cock followed by the spectacular blow. Uh, yes. The gun stuff goes over my head as I'm in the UK. Uh, Jan, I don't know if location has much to do with it, but a lot of people aren't familiar with guns and that's okay. Um, it's a it's a lot of stuff there. And I think that's why they're explaining it so much to the jury because not everybody um, knows guns. And even if you know guns some, you don't know guns that much. Emily, do you know why Hall's details are redacted in the prosecution witness list when nobody else's is? Even private emails are available, but he's treated differently. Goth boy UK, I don't know. Uh, it might've been because he has attorneys to remind them to do that. Uh, it's why I didn't show the witness list on screen ever. I don't like that they didn't redact the witness list when they filed them. Weird that Bullion seemingly isn't sitting at council table, right? How is he still counsel? He should be sitting there somewhere, but he has to leave. I don't know how he's um, he's still counsel. Uh, I checked Emily. I don't, I mean, I don't know about that. I, I think I was, I was good at what I did. Emily said, maybe this has been asked and answered, but... Uh, were the jury made aware of the charge change in defense attorney? No. Are they allowed to consider it as part of determining Hannah's character? No. No. It just, because that counsel is still sitting at table um, and another counsel is questioning and that happens. We saw it in Depp Heard when um, counsel would come in to cross-examine or question the experts and then they would be gone for a couple of days and then come back in. The jury doesn't need to be told. No attention needs to be brought to it. It's just court things. Is there any documentation submitted to the court regarding experts or would you just take their word for it? Um, they go through their background training and experience and are offered as, as experts based on their testimony, but the attorneys all get their um, resumes and things like that. Elizabeth Webster, EDB, I am 63 and laughed as well with the cock references. I think some humor is ageless. Runkle also laughed even though we're all going through our 13-year-old age. It's fine. It's just fine. Uh, Joe Jersey said, question, am I alone that adding the drug charges into this is shady? Seems like they want to use her drug use on why this happened, but they didn't drug test her. We're going to see, um, we're going to see what happens as we get further on. I don't like it either. I don't like it. I don't, I feel like it's a reach. I feel like the tampering with evidence is a reach, but we'll see what information they have. I'm trying to keep an open mind, but I don't like it. Alex says, is Baldwin facing jail time? Uh, prison time is prison time is um, an option in this case, up to 18 months for the charge uh, that Baldwin's facing. But also probation's possible. Uh, Slick said Russian accent, Mr. Bouillon does not trust banks. <laughs> Lawyer played court TV feed to court yesterday. I don't think that happened yesterday, but I heard that that had happened. Prosecutor had the stream playing and audio from the court TV was played in front of the jury, wasn't the defense. Okay, court, I don't know why the prosecution would be on court TV. Like, what are they looking for? The auto uh, the K, I, I'm gonna have to write, oh, I'm gonna have to go eat lunch. Damn it. <laughs> I have to go eat lunch. The autocorrect problem in chat is an iOS error. There is an update to fix. However, I have found it is better, but there are still bugs. K-Rab, that's very helpful. I will let my partner manager know. I imagine the team's on it. But since we stream to so many people, we always get kind of the first look at what's going on on YouTube with that. So I will let them know. Also, our chat is bay. Um, Emily, the special prosecutor knew better than to read the full phone numbers out loud. Yeah, I think so too. Still did. To me, that's dirty. I, I don't, there's things that both these attorneys have done that I don't like. I really also didn't like the way she snapped back at Bowles yesterday when he's like, will I be able to cross-examine? And she's like, if you do it right or whatever. I was like, Food Daily says forgetting to eat sounds very ADHD. It is, which is why I'm going to go eat right now. I also, there was something I wanted for lunch. My husband went to the store and I think I forgot him. I forgot to tell him what to get. Boo. <laughs> With all of that chat, uh, this will redirect, 
We're going to redirect the stream. We have not hit 745,000 subs yet. So don't forget to go, don't forget to go make the sub counter go wee. And I will see you after the lunch break. I will be back at 2 p.m. Court night might be back a little sooner than that. No spoilers. I like the ability to fast forward a little. It's made it so much easier. Uh, I will see you in just a little bit. Have a good lunch. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a Lawnerd. Nerd.